started. Welcome everybody to our retreat and community forum. Um, we're going to start uh, first by just giving you an update. Jill is not able to join us uh, today. Uh, Diane is running a few minutes late, but she is going to try to join us. She was she had too much uh, at school today, and uh, and Vera won't be able to join us uh, today. She has some family things. So let's get started uh, uh, with the board retreat, and I'm going to pass this on to Jen. <laughs> All right. So thank you, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Um, our hope today is that we can take some time to take stock of where we are right now relative to your board goals and central office capacity and uh, and what's, you know, what's relevant in the community uh, and refer back to our implementation plan and just to craft a plan for you all some next steps in terms of moving your board goals forward. In order to do that, we're gonna use a protocol that was in your packets. It's called the ping pong protocol. And I have adapted it for our use in a few ways. I've shortened some of the sections so that we can do it in 75 minutes. I have created a document to support you in terms of some note taking, which will end up being part of our public minutes. And, um, and I have asked you all to, um, to the extent possible to engage in some homework, and I'm going to share that with you in just a minute. So um, the first thing, again, is this protocol is going to allow us to um, engage in what I hope is a substantive discussion where all voices are heard. I, um, I think you know from me in the past that using protocols is a way to, um, I believe, to build equity, and we have a range of experiences experience in this space right now, um, from folks who've been veteran board members for a long time to some brand new folks, and we want to make sure that we're hearing from all of them. Uh, and I guess the other thing I would say that's highlighted in this particular protocol is that it's going to work best if we uh, enter it with a spirit of openness and, uh, and generosity and know that um, we're going to do what we can do and that by the end, we will have some conversations about next steps informed by the work that you do. And we may not completely finish every single uh, next step. It'll be a launching point for the next discussion. What questions do you have about the protocol before we begin? Okay. Um, and the next thing I'm gonna say is that I am doing my very best to facilitate this via Zoom. It's clearly not ideal. Um, so just bear with me as I toggle back and forth a little bit between sharing my screen and, and putting some links in the, in the, um, in the chat for you to, to reference. So the first thing again, you have your board goals. You had that draft calendar in your packet. We PDF'd the implementation report. Um, at the steering committee's request, I drafted a memo for you regarding uh, my opinions about current capacity at central office and um, asked you to the extent possible to, um, to just do some homework and do some reflection. I'm going to share my screen with you and show that to you. So I gave you this uh, link in the chat just a minute ago. Here, here are the raw results if you are somebody who prefers to see them this way. What I wanna share with you though right now is this. These are the responses and I think it's a nice way to see um, in the summary view what is going on so far. So of the 14 of you, eight of you were able to respond prior to tonight. That in itself, I would consider a data point, right? So consider that. I intentionally asked some scaling questions. Um, this is a tenet of the instructional coaching work that we've been doing in this district um, and a tenet of positive psychology to really think about scaling on a scale of one to 10, one being not near the goal, 10 being fully realized, where are we? And then we would ask, why are, and why are we a three and not lower, right? So, to generate some hope and optimism. So you can see on this particular question related to the community engagement goal of the eight of you who 
we're um, able to complete this work in advance, our range is from three to six. Uh, the next question is um, why. I asked why you gave it that goal. And again, you can see these answers. They're also available in that link. So I'm going to give you a minute to look at this particular work just so you have a framework for solving, you know, engaging in this conversation in a few minutes about where we are. I'm going to move it along and just give you a quiet moment or two on your own to look at this in a minute, but I want to show you the summary. Again, for your the second goal right now on long-term planning, same kind of scaling question, and you can see what the responses are. So between a two and a six. And again, why? Answers ranging from just what you've been dealing with in terms of um, the pandemic, what we've all been dealing with, to um, newness on the board. The last board goal right here, um, educational and academic outcomes, also a pretty wide range here. Folks are rating this anywhere from a two, so sort of just beginning, to a seven more than halfway done realizing this goal. And again, those responses. And then I asked you to just consider the strategic objectives. Um, so the first one on clear learning targets, um, and that's where you were on that one that range right now. And there's your raw data. And number two, a comprehensive and balanced assessment system. There's the range. And then number three, um, high quality instruction and intervention. And the why. And then um, I just asked anyone else have anything else um, that you wanted to share what was on your minds. So you have that information again in this format right now. I'm going to stop sharing. The first thing in this protocol that we're going to do is just um, given that information and your review, I'm going to ask you to just do some writing for um, about five minutes. I'll keep track on my stopwatch for you. And, um, and just to think about from your perspective, what's going on with, with our goals right now, given what you've read in advance and what you're gonna look at right now, um, jot down what's, what are some of the issues that are surfacing and how might it inform your next step. After you've shared that, um, done that silent writing, we're gonna share the reflections. We're gonna divide you into two groups actually in order to do that so that you can have some more substantial uh, discussion. And then we'll come back and do some probing questions. I will give you more information about each of those parts as we get to it. For right now, I would invite you to look at that data quietly and do some writing again from your point of view you write about the current situation relative to where you as a board are with your goals. And if you prefer to, um, to turn your video off during this time to do a little bit of writing, that's fine. I'll let you know. I'll give you a, about a 30 second warning and invite you to put your video back on and, um, and then we'll do some more talking. Got it? Okay. Yeah, and this is Steve. I don't got it. Where do we write? Thanks, Steve. You can just jot some notes to yourself 
for right now. We're going to share your bullet points in a Google Doc that I've created for you, but um, we'll do that in just a few minutes. So just on your own. Good question. All right, so if you haven't fully gotten your thoughts together, that is perfectly okay. I'd invite you to show your video again. And I wanna talk through the next part of this protocol. In your board packet is the hard copy of the protocol or, or you, know, you have it online. We're currently on step three. The protocol is on page eight of your board packets. This is um, sharing the reflections. And so, we are gonna uh, divide into two small groups. We've divided you, I've created those groups just based on um, uh, trying to make you in a mixed group across experience and, and town, all of those things. And what you're gonna do is um, each person is gonna have an opportunity to share their responses. If you've written in prose, you can just read what you wrote. If you wrote in bullet points, you can share those things as well. But what we want to do is um, two things. One, we want to make sure to capture your thinking. And so I put in the chat a Google Doc. Right now, you all have editing rights. So as you're speaking or as someone else is speaking, let's capture a few key bullet points. And we want to make sure that before the next person speaks, that anybody in your small group has the opportunity to ask clarifying questions. Clarifying questions are a question of fact right now. So, um, so any clarifying, and then make sure that everybody has a, a turn. We have about 15 minutes for this part. So again, I'm going to set my timer. Mark is going to put us in breakout groups in just a minute. I will toggle back and forth between your breakout groups to make sure that um, you are, if there are any questions that you have about how this is working, I can answer them for you. Before we go into those breakout groups, what questions do you have about this next step? Jen, Jen do you want us to write our own? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think, Corey, that might maybe, um, let me think about that. I think each group decide. If you can quickly decide, oh, someone will type for you so that you can speak, that would be great. And if it if it works better for you to type your bullet points, you do it yourself, okay? Got it. What we'll do after we've shared, because we're in two groups, we're gonna come back together. We're gonna share some quick highlights, give each other the opportunity to see that Google Doc. And then we'll segue to the next part, which is really where we have the, an opportunity to ask each other some probing questions about what's written. This is just sort of the sharing and the clarifying, okay? Again, I'm gonna keep track. Um, we have about 15 minutes for this. If I notice that everybody seems to be done, I'm gonna pull us back together a little early. And Mark, it is okay to send everybody to their breakout groups right now. So go ahead and join uh, group one or group two. So Jen, it sounds like they're gonna be taking notes. So there's nothing for me to do at this point to capture or- well, Yeah, well, Lisa, I think um, if you wanted to join a group to facilitate the note taking process, I'm sure they'd love it. You wanna do that? Where's the document to, oh, I see. I the, put it in the chat. I'm going to assign you to group um, two. They have more people, okay? Oh, okay. Just with the way the attendance worked. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I was trying to monitor on the paper card. I'm a little worried about you getting to share or not. Did you have that opportunity or not yet? No, I didn't, but I can put my comments in the chat. Uh, can you put them in that document? Is that okay? Yeah, in the document. In the document. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, you know, the one thing we had two groups, and um, and that I think for the sake of time, that is what made sense. But I also want to make sure that you all have the opportunity to see the comments of the other group before we go into um, into the questions. So I'm going to tell you about the questions so that you know what's next before you 
take a couple minutes to read what your um, fellow board members wrote. So we're going to spend um, up to 20 minutes, probably a little bit shorter than that, having the chance to ask probing questions of each other. I put in the board packet on page nine that pocket guide to probing questions. Probing questions are questions of um, substance. And actually on page 10, you can see that there are some possible probing question stems. So uh, wanting to know more about why somebody is thinking what they were saying, or what's your intuition or your hunch about this, or how do you feel about this, or what, what are your, you know, what most excites you about this, or what might you um, be afraid of regarding something like that? And we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to, um, to, to ask each member of the board probing questions. So I'm going to ask that we pay attention to that in a minute. As you're reading the um, questions, not only what, what you might ask and probe about, but also I'll try to keep track of who has been asked a probing question or not in the hope that at least everybody gets asked one. Does that make sense? OK. So I will, um, I'm going to share my screen with you again, and, um, and I will put the link to the doc in case you all want to see it again. So give me a minute. And again, just take a, about two minutes. Let me get to that again. And this is that document. And read what um, your colleagues have said. And again, as you're doing that, I'm going to just move this view and put this in the chat one more time for you. Which I think have so many things open. I'm going to stop sharing. You've got it. I'm going to put it in the chat for those who need it one more time. So again, you are reading your colleagues writing, you are wondering about probing questions, and you are maintaining a stance of curiosity and generosity. I'm going to check in in about a minute. And when you feel like you have had a chance to look that over and you have at least a few probing questions for your colleagues, can I see a thumb up, please? And keep it up while I can. I'm going to give it just another. 30 seconds or so till everyone's feeling ready.
All right. So I will um, again open this up and invite you to ask each other some probing questions. Again, on page 10 of your uh, packet, you've got some probing question stems. And I'll keep track of who's asked a question and who's been asked a question. And I'm just going to ask that we give everybody the chance to ask a question before we uh, ask the second question. And monitor yourselves in the hope that we um, get everybody, uh, you know, I ask everyone a question. I'm going to set my timer for 15 minutes and we'll see how it goes. Who would like to start and ask somebody else their first question? I see Jonas. Uh, Stephen, um, when you talk about, um, you said the board needs to make very clear expectations of how to measure outcomes um, and how to hold administrators responsible if outcomes are not met. Um, I I hear that. Can you expand on that? I'd I'd love I'd, I'd like to know more about what you how how we can set expectations for how outcomes are measured. You know, I the the data that because I agree with you that the data that we've received and the way that the whole board, because I'm not on, I haven't done ed quality, but the whole, way that the whole board has reviewed that has been kind of cursory. So Stephen, I'd just love to hear you talk about that more. Well, I'll talk about it in simplistic terms. And, and this isn't the, the examples I use aren't meaningful examples. I'm just trying to pick some off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But for instance, we want um, mass scores by a certain measure, whatever that measure is, um, to improve by 5%. That's an example. It would have to be expanded a little bit. You know, what's the time frame that it's encompassing? So, so it it, it needs to be better understood. But to me, that's a clear thing. We want a 5% improvement in this area, and this is how we're going to measure it, and we want it done by this time. And if that's not reached, people are going to be held accountable. Cut and dry. Yeah, I, it, to, to me, it's the, you know, it's, it's the how do we reach that metric, right? Is it all math scores go up 5%? Is it that, you know, some statistical measure of you know below a mean score is is raised. It, get, getting to that metric, I think, is 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 the the sticky part for me. I don't disagree, but uh, I don't know if it's a term Jen's heard. But if you don't measure it, it doesn't exist. So if if you're not measuring it, it doesn't exist. It's not a goal. It's just an aspiration. So it has to be very clear. This is our expectation. And if the staff, I'm not just talking administrators, if the staff doesn't reach that goal, then there's going to have to be an accounting of that. Why didn't that happen? And the board has to be willing to be firm. Thank you. So that's our first round of Q&A probing question answer. Who would like to ask the next question? Chris, I see your hand. And who would you like to ask it of? Chris, you're on mute. Um, I wanna follow up with Steven. And Steve, can you tell us what accountability might look like? Uh, from the board perspective. Did you Stephen, hear that you are muted now. So in the same way that most educators are held responsible, if if it's a if it's a um, if it's a lack of education, then some mandated training. Um, to improve um, mandated and supported training um, to in, improve their ability to accomplish those outcomes. Um, 
but I think ultimately it's in contracts and contract renewals. Thank you. Another question, and someone ask it to someone other than Stephen. Scott. Thanks, Jen. Um, take a break, Stephen. Uh, this one is, is for Chris. Um, I'm just noticing that in the, um, in the realm of community engagement, at, at least the notes in your block um, seem to be focused more on internal engagement rather than that is internal within the district um, as opposed to externally with um, the, uh, the people we represent. Um, is that because you're less concerned about the latter part? I think we have that under control better or um, just curious as to your the way you balance those out. So um, just as a practice, I don't usually take questions from Scott Thompson, but this time, but this time I will. Um, and Scott, I don't think we're really focused on community engagement as much as uh, governance issues in our block and having internal communication amongst all the different organizational um, aspects of, of our organization. Um, I do think um, community engagement with our community outside of the organization is very important. Uh, and I think that uh, we would um, serve our goal of um, having more community engagement well by actually establishing um, calendared events for community engagement um, and either open-ended or on specific topics, but actually get them on the calendar. Um, because if they're on the calendar, we'll do them. Um, and in, for outreach for the out, out to our community, um, kind of like we did with our board meetings, I would uh, like to see that we have community engagement at each of the schools, one after the other, but then also have a link there so that community members from the other towns, not from that particular school, could also engage. So it's a broad-based opportunity uh, for the entire community to engage in that forum um, at that time. And they could be based on a particular topic again, or just open answer and question um, um, forums. Um, just creating that opportunity for our community to engage, I think would be helpful. Thank you, Chris. Um, Kari, looks like your hand is raised. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question of Ursula, not to put you on the spot, Ursula, but um, you, and this builds on the last topic, I think. Um, you spoke about our engagement has been um, reactionary for, in large part, which I, I tend to agree with. And I'm wondering if you have some ideas um, or thoughts about what are the topics that we might um, um, raise with the community that would have more proactive engagement? And, and, and if, if, if you don't have any in mind, do you have any examples of, 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 of where you've seen success in either school or community endeavors where you can go out to the community and say, hey, we wanna talk with you about this, where it's been successful? cannot think off the top of my head um, times that I've seen success in getting community to come in to talk to you about something you want to talk about. Um, I think sometimes there has to be like a predictive um, aspect to something in that we as a board are looking at something, something's coming up. Um, I would use the curriculum review because it's the most recent and it got a very large group of people to come to a meeting. And that meeting was not the time to be able to take a large quantity of comments. Um, is that if as a board, we can look at some of the subjects and go, do we think it's going to be, you know, uh, a high topic item if it's going to cause concern within communities and then offer a public forum before like similar to tonight tonight we're doing a public forum meeting where we don't have a lot of business happening it's listening to the public come in and giving them that time and space to talk because they you know the public has sort of stopped talked about 
not feeling like they have enough time to comment um, at meetings. But I also respect that, you know, the board has also said like, we need to get stuff done, which is true. Was that expandable enough? Great, thank you. Who would like to ask the next question? Who has not asked from yet? Floor, and who would you like to ask it of? Uh, Kari. <laughs> Okay, it, it, we have talked a lot about this in the past, but in your, I'm just going back to the document and you were saying in checking in more often, right? In, uh, in as we set those, those goals. So I'm wondering as uh, a, something that could be achievable even within a, where we are right now, if last year we set some parameters as I'm, I'm just looking as we are going into budgeting, it, just reviewing those parameters that we set as a board and 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 seeing how they work if there's any way that there's some data available for us to see if those parameters were the right ones right we we achieved them by by creating a budget within those parameters but does it, putting those resources where we put them really helped <laughs> it, I, i'm just wondering if that's uh something that falls within what you are thinking? Um, maybe, I mean, it, it is, it is um, sort of a systematic way of approaching the budgeting process, which I'm definitely in favor of. Um, I, I think that when we think about budgets, you know, we, we go in, we set, set the parameters, we, we come out the other end. I think some reflection on the end about how that process went were the parameters we set the right ones, how did it inform the budgeting process? Doing that at the end of the budgeting process, we actually did that this last year, at least the finance committee did, and I thought that was good. We might also want to start the next year cycle by doing that as, as sort of as you're suggesting. And if there's any data that we can look at, that could, could set us up for a good budgeting process next. I think that's related to my comment about board goals. I was thinking about those three goals. Um, I think when we set goals, year-long goals, we should really um, prioritize them in in terms of the time and, and effort that we spend on them. Uh, you know, I, people may or may not like this idea, but I would sort of clear the decks and make make those goals the centerpiece of our meetings and our meeting agendas, um, and maybe put the those three right at the or whatever they are right at the beginning of so we're the freshest and most focused and and we're checking in on them regularly at least monthly um and we can understand our progress and and new, new when new people come come on board they understand that these are the priorities um i think we have opportunity to to do better that way so i think those are related in, in terms of being systematic about what how we use our time great Thank you. Um, who would like to ask the next question? Uh, Chris, I'm going to give someone else an opportunity sure. first who has not. McKaylin. Hi, thank you. Um, I just, I had a question for Lindy. Um, you mentioned in there kind of not being prepared um, enough about the U32 time change question and the backlash. Um, I'm wondering if you um, had ideas for how that could have been avoided um, in, in similar situations in the future. Sure. In our group, we were talking about um, communication and possibly board members participating, not necessarily participating, sitting in on other leadership meetings that we, and what I was saying was that might have helped us be a little more informed except generally when we're getting a decision that some people considered a big change, we've talked about it for at least a meeting or two before a decision. And that time, I think um, it was the first we'd heard about it. And in reflecting and what my comments were saying was um, we trusted that it had been discussed, it had been vetted and we voted and maybe that wasn't in our best interest. And I think in some cases, our agendas have been so packed that 
something like that comes up and it's added to the agenda and we may not have been giving it as much consideration as others felt we should have. So it wasn't a very, um, it wasn't well received by some, even though the decision may have been a very good decision. Um, I felt afterwards when I saw some of the backlash that if we had said, no, we need more time or something, we might have been accused of micromanaging because the leadership team had talked about. It. So it was one of those. And that comes back to the um, being more informed about changes that affect a large population that we ultimately make the decision on. And I have been very much um, vocal about having the comments at the beginning of our meeting. That would not have had anything to do though with public comments because it, it was presented, it was voted on. But we have changed that and I'm very much in favor of that. So I don't know if that answers it or not, but I just think having more information in advance and being uh, more open with uh, the public who attend our schools and their families. Thank you. So I wanna just do a time check everybody and a process check. So that's been about 15 minutes. We've asked six questions. There are lots of you who have not had a chance to ask or answer a question yet. And I'm looking at the clock. So. Um, I think this conversation is a robust one. I'd like to err on the side of continuing this, if that's okay with you. What it means is that um, we'll sort of do a quick uh, synopsis of next steps, maybe around, and then use that to continue later. Does that sound okay? Yes. Okay. So um, six of you have had the opportunity to ask a question. Um, somebody who has not yet asked a question, and um, again, ideally ask someone who hasn't answered a question yet. Stephen, Chris, Ursula, Kari, and Lindy have all been um, asked questions so far. So who'd like to go next? Ursula, do you have a question to ask? Yeah, great. Um, my question is for Jonas, and I think it sort of ties into some things that Lindy just talked about. Um, in the notes, you talk about mutual trust between board members and district leadership. And I was hoping you could, maybe because I'm new, I'm missing things, but expand on that. And I'm curious if you're talking some of what Lindy said, like that bus time situation where they brought us information and the board voted um, and maybe what you think could help. So I, when it comes to that situation, I, I agree completely with what Lindy said, right? That I think that we made, you know, I think we made the right decision, but I think we rushed it. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, you know, part of the community forum tonight is to try to, to make that right. Um, you know, we were, you know, we were told in the meeting, right, that this may have, you know, an impact on some families, right, with a different drop off time, and it may cause some confusion, but we'll work with everyone, right, and make sure everything uh, will work out. And, um, you know, I think we, I think we kind of hand waved away, you know, what sounds like it's a significant impact to some families. Um, when I'm talking about the trust between board and leadership, and I forget who else said this in uh, in our group, but like we, the, the leadership has to trust us that we will make the, the right decisions if we know the good and the bad, right? The, the flow of information that, that I've experienced has not usually included, here's what I think we should do. However, here's the counter argument, right? Here's the risk. Here's the downside. Here's what people may get upset about. Um, which has left the board in the position of having to discover that itself, um, which seems kind of like, you know, it's like a hunt and peck, like I'm not sure how to get that information. So the, I think the board needs to be trusted with, with the good and the bad and the risk, and we need that full scope of information. And I think that only happens when there's mutual trust going both ways. Does that, does that make sense? Thank you. Next question, I'd like to ask it, Lindy. All right, Jonathan, you're on the hot seat now. 
um, when I was looking at the notes, you mentioned the um, upswing in public attendance at our meeting since we went to Zoom. So I was looking at the um, prodding questions or the probing questions. And I, because you said for whatever reason, I also have noticed it. And I'm wondering, and I, I'll use a couple of them so you can answer it whichever way. What surprises you about that? Or um, what are you afraid of by this public? I don't know. I, I just am curious about all of a sudden we were having meetings with 80, 90 people at our meetings. And we used to be surprised if we had one or two guests. Well, I, I think I think there's a few answers really. Uh, I think, again, you know, like I said earlier, you know, we're still swimming in COVID stew. So part of it is that I think people were home, they, they weren't going out. So it was sort of uh, didn't really have an option. But it's also convenience, you know, people and I realize that internet connectivity in, in the state is, is spotty at best and certainly terrible for some people and not existent for others and pretty good for other people. So it kind of depends. But I think it's convenience. I think people, it was convenient for people to be able to check in. They didn't have to get in their car and drive to the school to be at a meeting, right? They can listen to the meeting while they're working on preparing dinner or doing whatever they're doing. So I think it's, I think it's those couple of things. And to think about it further too, uh, and it's good that people are are listening um, because then they can hear what we're talking about and they can be better informed about what decisions we're making and what and what our thought process is as we work through some of these issues uh, about governing the school and the district. So I, you know, I, I tend to err on the side of you know more information is better uh, so long as it's relevant information, right? And it's helpful to people. Um, but but so. So I think as we talk more about community engagement moving forward, it really would make sense to me once we're out of COVID land and we're starting to meet hopefully again in person that we ought to have as a practice, uh, a remote option for people too. Some people are going to want to come and sit in the room. Other people are going to want to stay home and, and, and uh, participate remotely. And we should have that as a practice going forward. Thank, thank you both. Uh, let's see, we've got Maggie, Stephen, Michaela, and Diane to ask questions. And I suppose I don't want anyone to feel completely on the spot. So if you don't have a burning probing question, um, if anybody else would like to ask a second question, of, but to somebody who has not answered a question yet. Let's give that opportunity and then we can move to the next part of the protocol. So anyone have a question for somebody who has not yet been asked a question? Chris. Jen, I don't have any probing questions at this point. I feel like I'm really just digesting what I'm hearing from my peers here and, um, and I, with the exception of the, the common theme of these goals are not SMART goals. And so to me, they strike me as more objectives than actual goals. Um, and that's something that is more, you know, a broad question for the whole board, not an individual. Great, thank you, Maggie. And that may well be part of what you're doing now uh, in a minute, which is when you synthesize that information and then think about next steps. That could be something to throw out at that point. Thank you. Um, let's looking at the time. Let's ask. Let's let one more question for now be asked. And I think Chris, you were the one to ask somebody who hasn't yet been asked. And I was going to ask Scott to um, identify um, how we can. Um, I think in his in his comments he. Uh, talked about the underlying systemic issues that can have impact on student achievement, um, if I'm remembering. Um, and Scott, if that is was part of your comment, how would we go about identifying what those underlying systemic issues are and addressing them? How is the board going to address them? Or how could the board address them? Well, first of all, 
um, the systemic issues that I'm referring to um, have to do with the, um, the really, what I think is um, desperate situation uh, that the data show for um, particularly for students on IEPs, um, but also the, the systematic disadvantage that um, free and reduced lunch students appear to be um, suffering. So what I, uh, essentially, when I'm um, looking at these students, not looking at focusing on these students, not so much um, in order to uh, take resources away from anybody else, but but you know, um, essentially channeling the the great social justice energy that's in our system right now, and turning it, um, turning that gaze inward on ourselves, and looking at our more uh, our, our systemically disadvantaged students as um, remedying their situation as basically the condition for the possibility of all of our students um, receiving um, uh, the best education we can give them. Um, so that if we do, um, if we have the, the um, you know, the, um, the skills, the policies, the systems, the, um, you know, essentially the organizational um, infrastructure to remediate the, um, the, the problems that our IEP students are facing, those same, that same structure will also carry along our uh, students who are not on IEPs or 504s or in any special category. Um, that this is, um, you know, uh, I think one of those paths through a crisis that will help us become better than we were before overall. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Scott. So the next thing that um, that I want to do is just give you an opportunity to synthesize what you heard. So again, you just in you can do that in your head minds. You can jot down some notes on a piece of paper. This isn't something that publicly is going to be shared right this second, but take about two minutes or so, synthesize what you've heard with an eye toward a possible next step. And, um, and again, th that next step conversation, we're going to need to shorten a little bit. Um, but if everybody can be prepared to share a next step that's on their mind, I think that will give us a good start. So about two minutes, um, just think about what you've heard and what you've read from each other and think about how that might inform next steps.
All right. So I am going to invite each of you to share a next step that's on your mind. I'm going to ask a couple of things. One, I'm going to say that um, if, if you're not quite ready to share, you may pass. I'm going to ask you to limit your response to one thing for the sake of time, just to get us started. Um, I'm looking at the time. We set up a little bit of a buffer between now and the um, and the community forum, so I'm going to sort of go into that time a little bit, but still allow for a, a break for everyone to just get up and get reorganized and ready for the community forum. But we'll go a little past 6:15. I think it's important to hear from everybody, and I'm going to call on you for the sake of efficiency. Um, and I'll let you know who's on deck. So I'm going to look for a volunteer to go first and share one next step. Okay, so Stephen, you're going first. And by my order here, I'm going to say, Jonas, you're on deck. Create one proper, smart, measurable goal. Great. Thank you. Well, my order just, okay. Jonas and then Jonathan, you're on deck. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a a preparatory statement um, that uh, I formally sympathize with the board member unnamed uh, who wrote that they have yet to meet a five year plan that has not been a clunky Soviet style device for creating the appearance of coordinated progress in the absence of its reality. I have no idea who you are, but I do agree with you. Um, there seems to be a real consensus on the board uh, that there is an imperative to raise outcomes for students on IEPs and students from historically disadvantaged situations. Um, I would like to hear from the professional educators that work for the district, what a what measurable goals, you know, are would be appropriate and achievable toward um, toward meeting that that absolute need. Great. Thank you, Jonas, Jonathan, and then Lindy, you're on deck. Yeah, I would. Uh... I would say that we continue our efforts to reach community members, make ourselves and our decisions and priorities clear and available. Thank you, Jonathan. Lindy and then Scott. Um, I would like us to investigate uh, one meeting that is the nuts and bolts business type meeting a month and one that's focused on a goal or public forum type um, and limit them from six to eight. That doesn't increase the time per month, just the two that, cause we were running three and four hour meetings. Thank you, Scott and then Maggie. You're on mute, Scott. Thank you. Um, just to pick up on what others have um, alluded to, I think the, um, it's a good idea to separate the um, the current three goals, the colored goals, and have those be um, just part of the board calendar as objectives or however we want to call them, and then go with the SMART goals that Stephen and um, Maggie and others have been referring to that are more, and, and Kari, that are more sort of focused, um, time dependent, situational. Thank you, Maggie, and then Chris. Okay. Um, in order to inform development of measurable goals, um, I would love to see a formal and concise brief survey for all stakeholders, with multiple choice options and a free type field on two of the three goal areas defined right now, communication with the community and educational and academic outcomes. Because I think that would be a, an easy way to hear from both educators, administration and community members, including um, the parents um, and the students potentially as well. Because I think it'd be very difficult to come up with specific um, uh, approaches to meet those goals without hearing from all the stakeholders. Thank you, Maggie. Chris and then Diane. So the next step uh, for me would be to strengthen internal organizational trust, communication and information flow. Thank you, Chris. Diane and then Ursula. So 
two things. One, I think we need to connect with our buildings. So not just our communities, but also our buildings. We need to figure out a way, even in this COVID context of how we uh, connect to the life that's going on in our buildings, our school buildings. And then also uh, really taking a look at um, all the ways that, what are our successes and our failings. Um, so there are a variety of reasons why kids are not accessing and able to progress. We know the numbers and data around, at least some of the data around our IEP kids, but we're also failing a large other number of kids too. And so taking a look at that and figuring out what, what can we do differently. Thanks, Diane. Ursula and then McKaylin. Um, this laid in, a few of mine have been taken, but I'm gonna say, um, along the lines of supporting our students and our educational goals, having some work between the education quality policy group or education quality committee and the policy committee to make proper policies that guide um, curriculum and therefore hopefully educational outcomes. Thanks, Ursula. McKaylin and then Thor. Um, so I think one common theme is um, the importance of building bridges. So I would propose um, like a monthly meetup in each town, welcomed, you know, community members, school staff, teachers, et cetera, just an informal um, opportunity to gather information. Thank you. Flor and then Kari. I, I have just one like really <laughs> strict one, like try to establish a board process to review and analyze student data on the proficiency in our student learning outcomes to inform uh, that data, to inform our, uh, align it with our budgeting process. Thank you. And Kari. Thanks, I'd, I'd like to, us to refine our board goals using the SMART format and uh, also being realistic about our capacity and the capacity of the leadership team this, in this coming year. Thank you. So we will consolidate all of this information and then I think probably um, take it first to the steering committee would be my guess to see next what the next steps are in terms of moving all of this forward. I hope that this protocol was one that you found helpful in terms of enough time to reflect and hear from each other and sort of synthesize and think next steps. Um, and so that ends this portion of the meeting. Flora, if you wanna take it away. Yeah, thank you first, Jen, for, for being an awesome facilitator. I, I think, you know, obviously this would have been better in person and with more time, but I think, uh, with all the constrictions, this was good for everybody. It, it's uh, six twenty almost. We're gonna take a ten minute break so that you can be fresh to start the community engagement. Since we told them six thirty, and at that point, I I, I share with you what our thoughts are uh, on running the community engagement and just be thinking about a, a very brief introduction of you know uh, just who you are. And uh, not, you know, not going in depth because we want to hear from community, but just uh, inter we're going to introduce each of you so the community starts to feel comfortable with their new board members and their old board members. <laughs> okay, have a good 10 minute break and we'll see you right at 630. Thanks, Jen. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. appreciate that. That was well done. Okay, it's 6.30. It looks like we have about 46 people in the meeting, with, including us. So I think we have enough members of the public. So we're gonna get started. Welcome to our first community engagement, our first of many, we hope. Uh, the purpose of today's community engagement is to start building trust with our communities uh, intentionally by engaging and collaborating uh, with us. Uh, by us, I mean, you know, the school leaders, you, our community, and school board members. 
we want to hear different perspectives, and this is just the beginning. We want to have an ongoing two-way uh, process of building relationships and working collaborative to support all our students, which is at the end why we all are here. Uh, I, I'm going to ask the board members to do a brief introduction and then community members and staff members, as you speak, please uh, introduce yourselves when you ask questions, the community member, and just say, you know, who you are here for, if you have a student, it, it's great for us to put a face in which community you are from and get to know you. So we have, I have some norms that I'm hoping that we can just all listen to for this minute and see if I could get thumbs up from all of you in, as we start this community engagement. One, please be fully present. We're here to engage with you. So just be here for that. Respects other studies or other stories and perspectives. Assume best intentions. Uh, recognize that we need each other to move any work forward. So please listen to each other, be kind, and there's no wrong questions. So please ask any question. We are going to start with the, with the introduction of the board members just briefly, and then I'm going to pass it on to Jen so we can move on into COVID. Jen and Stephen and Maria. Uh, so if I'm going to just call you by name to, or, or actually I'm not going to call you by name. I'm going to start uh, because, and then I'll stop talking. And then Jen, when all of the board members have introduced themselves, please uh, pick it up so we can, we're here to listen to you and I want to minimize the time that we're talking. So I'm Floor Diaz-Smith. I live in East Montpelier and I'm the chair of the board. It's nice, uh, really happy to be here. Can somebody else jump without? <laughs> I'll jump. I'm Lindy Johnson. Um, I live in East Montpelier. I have two children who went through the system and are graduated. Uh, this, is Steve. I, this is Steve. Look, we'll get the East Montpelier people out of the way. Uh, I live in East Montpelier. Hi, uh, my name is Chris McVeigh from Middlesex, um, and I'm happy to be here and hope that you find this uh, process engaging. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ursula Stanley. I am from Middlesex as well, and I am new to the board, and I have two kids currently in our system. Hi, I'm Diane Nichols Fleming. I'm from Berlin, and um, I have two children who aren't children anymore, and they graduated from the system. I'm, I'm Jonas Jonathan Van Fleet. Ah, oh. Jonathan, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Jonas. Jonathan Goddard from Berlin. Uh, I have three children that uh, graduated uh, from U32 as, as well. And I'm glad to be here and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. I'm Jonas Eno Van Fleet. I live in Worcester. I have a fifth grader at Doty and uh, next year we'll add a kindergarten to that mix. I've been on the board since the district was created in June, 2019. And I'm Nick Kalen. I'm the new board member from Worcester. I am a Doty and U32 grad, and I have um, a kindergartner and fifth grader at Doty right now. I'm Maggie Weiss. East go Calus, for it, Maggie. <laughs> East Callis, Callis Town, um, former district um, employee, and I have one child who has been in the school system and one that is currently a freshman at U32. Replaced Dot Naylor, not replaced, but um, taken the position filled by her, her leaving. And I'm the one who so rudely interrupted Maggie, Scott Thompson. I too live in Callis um, on the Callis Worcester frontier. And my last child went through the system and graduated this past June. Hi, I'm Kari Bradley. I live in Callis with my wife, Gabrielle, and I have three children who are products of the uh, system. And I myself am a proud alumnus of Callis Elementary and U32. Awesome. So thank you, everybody. Um, I am Jen Miller-Arsenault. I'm currently serving as the acting superintendent and the curriculum director. And 
Tonight, there were two topics, the first of which is COVID-19. So I want to share with you um, quickly a few of the highlights regarding the mitigation strategies. I want to make sure to introduce Maria Malekos, our COVID-19 coordinator, share a little bit about the East Montpelier situation, because I know that's on folks' minds, and then open it up for questions and concerns. So earlier today, we sent um, we sent a few uh, letters of correspondence to the community. We've sent another one again, just reminding folks that we have multiple mitigation strategies. Um, we are currently uh, masking universally indoors. We are encouraging all students and staff to stay home when sick. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the years recently in our, on our ventilation systems, and so they are all functioning optimally right now, and indeed, we're sort of ahead of the game in that regard. Um, we are looking at vaccinations and encouraging vaccination. We just held a clinic the other day at U32. We're promoting uh, hand hygiene um, along with just basic cleaning and sanitizing processes. We're accessing our outdoor spaces for eating and learning as practicable. Uh, we are uh, potting or cohorting in the elementary schools to the extent possible. Um, and we are maintaining physical distancing to the extent possible. One big difference from last year to this year is that um, all of our students are in school, which means we have some robust and wonderful attendance. It also means that um, it is not possible for us to always maintain three feet all of the time. And we also are not uh, set up in a way that allows us to pod as strictly as we did last year. We're paying attention to our elementary kids being in classrooms as much as possible, but we can't say that we're podding like we did last year. Uh, we, we just, we can't uh, feasibly. We're doing it as much as possible. We are not podding at U32 right now. Um, we have some new information. Folks have been interested in surveillance testing information. So Maria can probably share a lot more detail about that than I can. Um, we are going to host voluntary surveillance testing, hoping um, either next week or the week after that it will be our turn to get that going and um, hoping by the end of this week to send out a consent form for families. And, um, and again, really uh, wanna underscore the importance if you, um, as a student or an adult in your household is a close contact that we're encouraging folks to get tested. So with that, I want Maria to introduce herself to you. Um, I'll share a little bit about East Montpelier and then let's open it up for um, your questions and concerns. Maria? Hello, uh, my name is Maria Malekos and I am the COVID coordinator school nurse leader this year. Um, I was going to tell you a whole lot of stuff that Jen already told you, um, but so I can talk a little bit about surveillance testing. Um, the state is offering surveillance testing for schools on a weekly basis. This is going to be open to staff and students um, regardless of vaccination status. So um, the logistics are still coming down the pike in terms of how uh, we're going to get those tests and get them returned in a timely manner, um, but we should know all of that by the end of this week. Um, so I just want to say that all of our students' safety is first and foremost in our minds as we make all of the choices that we're making this year. And I welcome all of the feedback um, and uh, ideas that everybody has. At this point, we're all in this together. Thank you, Maria. And um, I think up front, I want to share so a little bit more information about East Montpelier, and then we'll open it up. So as you know, um, East Montpelier students are learning from home right now. We had two positive cases um, implicating 38 kids. We had um, about 19 siblings. Uh, that meant we had all but I think one, Alicia can correct me if I'm wrong, all but one classroom potentially impacted and 10 staff members who were close contacts. We spent a lot of time, uh, Maria, the school nurse, Alicia Lyford, the principal and I, figuring out what best to do. And as Maria just said, our students' health and safety is absolutely at the forefront of our decision-making process. And we felt that um, keeping people home, given the circumstances, made sense. It is also true that because we're not under a state of emergency right now, 
we're not achieving 51% attendance in school physically. And so currently, those days don't count as attendance days. What that means, however, is we still, because we did such a good job with this last year, we are taking attendance. We, are, we made sure to provide meals to students who need meals and we are keeping track of all of the learning synchronously and asynchronously in which our kids are engaged. We, the state minimum is 175 days. We right now are having 176 at this point in time and we can always request a waiver for attendance down the line. I think that we're likely the first school that is experiencing this and probably not the last. I wanna say up front, the Agency of Education has been really responsive to this particular situation and that we're hoping that um, this will be uh, just information gathering down the line. But I wanted to be really clear and upfront with you about that because there have been questions about that. Um, and with that being said, I think Floor, we're ready to open it up for questions and concerns. Okay, so if people could raise their hands so I could see them in the participant list, that'd be great. Goodness, uh, let me see, I, miss, I see one, sorry. Oh, there, Becca. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, going first. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Becca Mandel. I'm a parent of, a, of two kids at Rumney. Um, I'm an alumna of Rumney on U32 as well. Um, <clears throat> and um, I have some questions. I guess it was really helpful to hear what um, sort of a little bit more about East Montpelier. Um, and I guess the, the, large, the larger frame for my questions is why we aren't taking the same mitigation me measures that we took last year. Um, we know that the Delta variant is, is much more contagious than the variant you know, that we were dealing with last year. Um, and our, all the kids in the elementary school still aren't vaccinated um, and can't be vaccinated. So um, we know that transmission is, is, is just so easy between unvaccinated people um, and kids are getting this variant, you know, at the same rate as adults, but just the, the sheer numbers, a lot more kids are getting sick. So I'm just, I'm confused about that. So that's sort of like the large framing, like what are the barriers? We know what to do we did them last year, they worked great, you know? Um, we didn't have any remote days due to COVID in our, in our elementary school last year. Um, so I'm just, I'm confused about that. So that's like the big question. And then, um, you know, we were really uh, impressed with how we handled COVID last year with the outdoor classrooms, keeping the kids in pods. My son is, is not potted. Um, he's in a one, two, so he's going into two different classrooms. So if there was one positive case in the second grade, the other one, two, second grade, I assume that he would be a close contact in that situation and both classrooms would be close contact. So I'm just confused about the lack of pods, especially when at Rumney, there is an empty classroom um, in the primary wing that's not being used from what I understand. Um, and so, you know, I also know that they're using shared tables again instead of individual desks. Um, and last year, um, you know, we had this great work day for families. We all came together before um, the start of school and built all these outdoor classrooms and geared up so that the kids could actually safely be outside as much as possible. And, you know, the reality is that I understand that's more work for teachers and I really wanna support teachers during this hard time. Um, and we all know that being outside is actually better for kids, right? Like they learn better. All this, you know, there's all these outcomes that go up. So I'm curious about why they, why we weren't asked to come back and help rebuild the outdoor classrooms this year. Um, you know, because I know some of them had fallen apart over the summer. So I'm curious uh, when when folks say that we're being outside as much as possible. I actually want some real information about what that means, because that could mean anything from like, oops, we popped our heads outside for two minutes today to actually we spent two thirds of the day outside. We ate all our meals outside and this is what happened. And, you know, this is the time of year that the weather is really nice for being outdoors. Um, and another piece of this is that you know, we know this COVID, this Delta surge, a lot of them have been peaking about two and a half or three months or so. So it would potentially, you know, get us through to that, to October when it's still safe to be outside a lot more. So I'm just curious about why we didn't 
start off with more of the mitigation measures that we ended the school year with last year, knowing that we're in a period of real hard time with the hope that, um, that it will sort of burn itself out like these other variants have. Um, and so, um, uh, and I'm also curious about the three to six feet apart stuff. I, I heard you say that that's not necessarily possible. I guess I'm wondering like, what percentage of the time are the kids really close together and why is that? And what, you know, what else can we do creatively like we did last year um, to, to make that work? Um, and, and I guess my sort of final two final things, and I'm, I know I'm talking a lot. Um, I was on a, a work-related call about the virus and a, with an infectious disease expert from New York City who said that um, uh, Delta is presenting in children with different symptoms than some previous variants have. And so she's seen a lot of her children come in who are positive with gastrointestinal symptoms first and then um, nose and respiratory symptoms. So I, I guess it, that just sort of underscores for me um, questions about why we're not doing the checks. Um, you know, we don't have universal paid leave here. It's really hard to keep your kid home when they're sick because it means you have to stay home too or find childcare or backup, especially at the elementary school level, like that week of remote learning, that strikes terror in my heart. Um, Cause doing remote learning with my kids means one of us, one of my partner and I is, are not working all week. Um, and, you know, I don't know where that time is coming from. Um, so, you know, that's one piece of it. And I also just think that um, we need more information as a community about what it means to keep your kid home and what those things, what those things are that we should be looking for. Because I think a lot of the guidance I have been seeing is not necessarily updated for this new data about how Delta is showing up in younger children. So I'm just curious why we haven't brought back the health screenings. Um, and if there's plans to do that. And then I guess finally, um, uh, you know, what is it that you need from us as parents to get some of these mitigation measures back in place? Um, what can we do? Can we build the outdoor classrooms again? Can we, um, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but, but we can't, the, the, having to pivot to remote learning without having done some of the mitigation measures that we knew worked so well last year, it just seems like a pretty bitter pill to swallow for all those families. And I'm just waiting for it to happen at Rumney and um, figuring out the juggle of that without any vacation time left. We just had summer, so I took all my vacation time. <laughs> so then maybe I should have planned ahead, but um, I guess Thank I, you know, so that's, Thank that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. That's okay. Thanks. So there were several questions there. So I let Jen and Maria. Uh, yeah, Maria, do you want to start with the, um, the issue on the, the mitigation strategies and those differences? <clears throat> so um, some of the changes that we made in our mitigation strategies were based on the science. Um, some things changed. Uh, last year, we learned a little bit more and the CDC changed a little bit of their guidance. Um, some of the reasons why the mitigation strategies are not as strict have to do with the reality of 25% more students in the school and approximately 8% less staff than we had last year. Um, so some things are not as easily reproduced as we would like them to be. However, um, when we look at what we aren't doing last year, we are not strictly potting, and that has to do a lot with um, resources within each individual school. Uh, whether if we have more students, obviously one open classroom in a school is not going to balance out that 25% student, 25% um, uh, of students that came back from remote learning. So we're everybody is doing the mitigation strategies as, as as strictly as they are actually able to do. And that looks different in every school. And that looks different in every classroom. If you have a classroom of seven, it's very different than what a classroom of 26 is gonna look like. Um, so that's some of the reality of what we're dealing with. Um, oh, sorry, I thought you walked away for a second. So I want to talk um, a little bit about outdoor education. I think everybody is um, open and willing to continue having children outside. Um, what different schools have done 100% to prepare for that, I can't speak to. I, I think the principals have some ideas of 
um, what worked last year and what didn't work last year. Um, and so I'll let them speak to that. Um, the next thing that I wrote down is um, keeping kids out when they're sick and why we're not using base camp. So base camp had several, um, several uh, deficits that, that didn't work for us 100%. One of them was that it didn't yield any appreciable data for us um, while creating a whole lot of extra work in the mornings, right? Um, the other issue is that honestly, if, a, if we, if in the, this is just complete reality, if a parent is going to give their child some Tylenol and send them to school, base camp is not going to, ter to deter them from doing so. It was not a truth meter. People put whatever they needed to put in to go to work, to get their kids to school. We still ended up seeing those children in our offices as school nurses. So we have talked at length with the staff at all of the schools. The teachers are aware that we have a zero tolerance policy for illness at school. The only exception to that is children who have medically diagnosed alternative diagnoses, right? So if somebody has environmental allergies that present during a certain part of the year, we can take that into consideration if they come to our office with a runny nose. With that said, we're well aware that actually one of the most common symptoms that we see in kids who are presenting that will be testing positive for COVID is plain old runny nose, which lots of kids have. And just like last year, we have zero tolerance for any symptoms that could mimic a COVID symptom. Our symptoms that we put out to everybody do include um, stomach pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So those are the GI symptoms that you're speaking of. We're aware that GI symptoms present in children differently than adults. And our teachers are all instructed that if a child says they don't feel well, they call the nurse, they tell them what the child is complaining of, and that way the nurse can triage and decide if they need to go into our isolation rooms or if they can come into the school health office. And then as nurses, we assess the child. And we ran into a lot of kids last year who were really good at symptom shopping and got themselves home without being sick because we were absolute zero tolerance. I can tell you that many parents can attest to the fact that they brought their kids home and didn't feel it was warranted. But we feel very strongly that staff and students should stay home when sick. That's part of our layered mitigation strategy. Um, so the other problem with base camp is that base camp's algorithm was not the same as our district protocols. And as nurses, we spent lots of time on the phone with people saying, no, 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 that's not right. Don't listen to base camp, have them come in. And with Delta changing as quickly as it is, base camp's algorithm is not going to keep up. And we just felt like it wasn't something that, um, that actually helped us in the long run, that it was actually ta tasking employee hours that we could better use elsewhere. And um, we still, of course, have asked all parents to keep their children home when they are sick. And we have to rely on the integrity of the community to keep our schools open and safe. Um, so what have I missed from your question? Becca? Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to respond. Um, I I guess it, it feels like we're sort of starting from a place of here are these parameters um, and we can't change them. And so we're working within a much more confined space of what our options for mitigation are. And I guess my sort of 30,000 foot question is why is that, right? If, why did we take, for example, if there's more kids in the classroom, I know there's kids who did want the remote option for the year. Like, it, and if that's causing our classrooms to be more crowded, like why is that off the table? Why are we working within a much smaller sort of space of options when we had so many more options last year and maybe the ability for some children to be remote for the whole year would then allow the classrooms to have more space. And why isn't there like more guidance that's clearer about like, what does it mean to, to have, to be outside as much as possible? What does it mean to eat outside in safe ways? What does it mean to set up the classrooms as safely as possible? So um, I guess I still, like there's still like a larger- um, Sure. Um, so I understand I that. I can let you know that the option of remote learning was taken a away, right? That That is a state, that's an agency of education decision. Am I correct in that, Jen? I can say um, 
It was under the it was under the state of emergency that remote learning like like we were able to offer last year was an option. It's not an option right now. Um, what we can do is offer some remote possibilities that we that existed pre pandemic. And for us, mostly that is um, high school students ability to, to access classes through the Vermont virtual learning cooperative. So um, that's an AOE sort of state of emergency decision. So we, we're working within those parameters. Um, and as far as the guidance, we had full expectation again. So I wanna say this very clearly that the, the AOE has been very helpful within what it is that they can do. And I'm not trying to push any blame off on the agency of education. We fully expected on August 5th of this year to receive a document that was very similar to last year's document that literally broke down everything we were supposed to do. And they came out with a document that had far less guidance and, and really no um, specific parameters for us to open up with. Um, so part of my job is that I have gone school to school to school um, and I'm talking to teachers about, and I'm trying to empower them. Your classroom doesn't have to look like the next person's classroom. What I want you to do is remember your mitigation strategies. And what I wanna really impress here is that our mitigation strategies have not changed from last year. We have amended them to match the science and we have gone over those decisions again and again and again. Both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC are super clear that in-person learning is the priority this year. And therefore, if social or physical distancing would preclude schools opening that lean more heavily on your other mitigation strategies to balance out the fact that you can't physically distance with fidelity. So we are working to keep three to six feet, children three to six feet apart in the classroom as much as possible within that classroom. We are working with um, making sure that masks are worn at all times indoors and properly. We are doing surveillance testing. We're keeping people home when they're sick. We're potting when possible. And there are schools that have smaller populations that are able to pod with more fidelity than the bigger schools are. Um, so we have poured over this guidance that we're looking at from the CDC and we have figured out how we can make that work for each school. So each for each school being outside as much as possible is gonna look different. Um, a lot of that, some of that has to do with teacher comfort. Some of that has to do with the content that they're teaching. Some of that has to do with whether they have a door that opens up into an area that's conducive for teaching. Um, so we do have stricter parameters this year than we did last year and that we are working with exactly what we have this year. Um, I also, and I didn't say this when I introduced myself, I'm not sure why, because she's sitting right here, but I have a seventh grader in the system who is young enough to be unvaccinated. And I am just as invested, if not more, than, than anybody else to make sure that we keep these schools as safe as possible, not only for our students, but for our staff and our community. Um, and and I, I really think that everybody's working as hard as they can towards that goal. It is a logistical um, marathon and we've just gotten started and we may have stumbled in a few places in the first day or two while everybody's trying to figure it out. But as the days go on, we get more confident and we get better at sliding ourselves where we need to be to keep these kids safe. I just want to impress that at no point have we ever said, eh, let's just do this. We, we are working so hard to try to make it happen with what we have. Um, so I, I, you know, we, we tried to sort of trim the fat as it were with base camp. Um, and, uh, and other than that, we're following the CDC guidelines to the letter with what we need to do with high community transmission. May I ask one follow-up question and then I'll, I'll um, see the floor. I know I've, spoken a lot um i just the one, one thing like, minute, um, becca, just, just hold on when one one minute becca i i just want to get a sense of how many other people are in the that want to ask questions I see holly has a question too 
And also would like to invite the possible principals to have, we have like a, have a minute to just a, brief a little bit in the outdoor room classroom a question that was there because it's different every, at every school and just give them the opportunity to, to share a little bit so each individual community can hear from them too. A, is there anybody else besides Becca and Holly? And then, okay, so Becca, one more question. It was just a follow-up about the, the outdoor classrooms and how I was wondering if the state of emergency made those not feasible this year. And that was just my follow-up. Yeah. Okay, let's wait on that one if you're okay. And I'll let each principal speak to the outdoor classroom uh, situation. Holly? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am Holly Lane. I live in East Montpelier. I have a graduate of U32, a senior at U32 is actually doing early college, a freshman at U32, and a fifth grader at East Montpelier. Uh, I just want to start out by saying I truly appreciate the board's uh, making this opportunity for the community to have this conversation. I think it's so important for us to begin rebuilding the community after the rough year we've had. So thank you very much. Um, I think some of the principals might address this, but I'm just wondering, um, looking at things like the situation that happened in Waterbury with the day camp, um, where there were a number of cases that happened after kids were outdoors and unmasked, um, even though the guidelines coming from the CDC or the health department here may not be addressing that, seeing something like that in a neighboring community um, kind of makes me wonder why we might not be choosing to do masking outside in, on our playgrounds. I know that they are not uh, requiring masks for students at EMES on the playground. And I'm also wondering, um, just in relation to that, as, as principals address the outdoor classroom questions, um, when kids are doing the outdoor learning in the outdoor classroom situations, are they wearing masks during those times? Um, so thank you very much. I look forward to getting some more info on that. Thank you, Holly. Jill, I mean Jen, do you have? Do you want to? Yeah, I'm gonna. I will start that response, and then Maria, if you want to help too. Um, the leadership team met for three hours yesterday and talked a lot about COVID protocols. Given just you know to to check in and debrief after the first few days of school, and we spent a lot of time talking about um, outdoor masking and. Um, what we have landed at is that, again, as Maria said, we are following the CDC guidance and the American Academy of Pediatrics um, guidance. And there is no scientific evidence that masking outdoors uh, is necessary. So I'll, I'll lay, I'll put that out. Um, we've talked a lot about trying to balance the emotion and fear that we know exists and that we're all feeling too and the science so that we can have clear um, protocols for making our decisions. So I'll introduce that by saying that, Maria, what would you add to that response? Um, I, you know, just a little more of the data, right? So um, there's a study out of Iceland that states that less than 0.1% of all transmission has occurred outside. Um, the CDC, it doesn't present um, what they say is less than 10%. And then there's this um, really interesting study that talks about how wildly inaccurate, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I got a chill. How wildly inaccurate that number is. Um, and what they recommend is that people can mask, they recommend that people mask outside in a very crowded outdoor setting with the example of an outdoor concert. Um, so any place like a fair or a concert or even a, a farmer's market, I would consider it. Um, but when we talk about a school with a population of 100 that's split into two recesses across a huge piece of property, um, we don't have the science to back up the need to mandate that. Um, and that's where we are right now with that. Um, and so, yes, what happened in Waterbury happened, but we, the minute we move from the science, we hit a slippery slope of just making decisions arbitrarily. And I think it's really important um, 
to say that we, you know, we had guidance that we could follow from the AOE. We chose to go sh as strict as we could go by using the CDC. Um, and when that science changes, we will amend our practices accordingly. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, Holly, do you, your hand is still up. Do you have a follow up or can I go to Nick and let the principals maybe will answer your other questions? Is that possible? Yeah, I just, a very quick follow up. So sure. um, I understand all the guidance and I appreciate that the school is, is working to, to use the CDC guidance in the most strict guidance. But as my 10 year old who's listening in just said, yeah, but everybody's all clumped up on the playground. So that's just what I'd like to add to that. And um, I, I'd love to hear from Alicia because she's right there seeing it all as it's unwinding. So thanks. Thank you, Holly. Uh, Nick, and then we'll move to, we'll start with Alicia since you mentioned her and then we'll move, I'll let Nick ask his question first because he's the only other person with a hand up. Hey, Nick, Hi, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Nick. I live in East Montpelier, and I'm also a, a product of the the district. I graduated from U32. Uh, I just quick thank you to the board for the opportunity, and uh, just express my thanks for the MES staff. Um, you know, we were always impressed, and then after seeing what the effort they put in and the leadership through the whole pandemic has been, uh, we've just been blown away. So, very grateful to be here and and um, have these folks working with our children. Um, so a couple of things. I just wanted to say that I largely support the level of mitigation that's in place at this time. Um, I definitely agree with eliminating base camp. Um, as Maria said, it was, you know, it just seemed like extra work that maybe didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, didn't bear a lot of fruit. Um, and I think that uh, I also agree with the no masking outdoors. Um, and just in my opinion, I think that's, uh, you know, those were a couple examples of you know, returning to data-driven decision-making. So uh, I'm, I'm supportive of those. Uh, a couple of questions I wanted to ask just to clarify. <clears throat> uh, Jen, I think you had mentioned that the AOE had taken away the virtual option. And so the, car, the part I was just kind of curious about is like, but we were in, in East Montpelier, we were virtual this week. Um, so I, to clarify, did you mean that the AOE took away like the full-time virtual option? And they're maybe still allowing it in a, these scenarios. So um, when the state of emergency was lifted, the ability to teach our kids remotely and, um, and have the day count for attendance when it was the whole school went away. So you have to have at least 51% of your students present. What that meant was a school right before us, right before East Montpelier, Twinfield, for example, shut down a few grade levels, kept them home because of positive cases. But because Twinfield was a K-12 school, they achieved overall 51% attendance. So these days, with the because we're not in a state of emergency right now, they technically don't count as student days unless something shifts down the line for the state being responsive or um, if we can get a waiver down the line. So what we chose to do was err on the side of, of safety and put in place what we know um, were sound practices in which we engaged last year. Um, and so that's sort of where we are. So East Montpelier with keeping folks home this week would be at 176 days. The state requires 175. And we'll have to see how it goes. Again, I'm I'm thinking that um, we're the first school in the situation, but I don't think we're going to be the only school in the situation. But yeah, so, technically under that, it doesn't exist. And then that um, Nick, the second part of your question about um, a full remote option that that is not in existence. We ran a really amazing um, remote option for our kids last year, and um, and we're that we are not able to do that because we're not in a state of emergency. So kids needed to come physically to school or, um, or homeschool. And that's why our numbers have increased so much as well. Understood. No, and then for my own, you know, um, I, I, I wouldn't choose a virtual option for our kids anyways. I just wanted to make sure I understood, I had heard that correctly. Um, but to sort of carry on from that point though, so if these, 
if these remote days don't count towards our tally, I guess really the one big question I had coming into this whole meeting is that um, is like what we did at East Montpelier this week, is that a sustainable solution for the school year? Like in terms of shutting down the whole school, anytime there's any amount of COVID positive cases, um, particularly given, like you said, if those days don't count, um, and sort of adding to that, if there's going to be surveillance testing, then, you know, potentially there's even more positive cases sort of being rooted out that way. Um, so I, I just, and you'd mentioned a, a neighboring school district, right? They closed down certain grade levels or portions of the school. So I didn't know if there was, you know, any, any option to pursue something like that. So we could, cause we don't, I don't think the kids want to be in school till July either, you know? <laughs> So I will say, um, again, since since going through this, the Agency of Education has been very responsive. I know that they are gathering a lot of data and hearing from a lot of folks. Um, and it may be that they are respond what they're saying now, they might need to respond differently down the line. But I can't say that and I can't predict that. I'm just sharing information and documenting everything, working with our administrators and our teachers. Um, and you know, the bottom line for us is that our students' safety and health is first and foremost, and we'll figure everything out as we have to, but we need to ensure that the measures that we are taking are the right ones to keep our community safe. Understood. Yeah, that's the best I can answer that question right now, Nick. Yep. Um, and then the last one, last quick thought was just to ask if there would, had, was there any consideration of conducting a poll among the parents in terms of um, sort of where they all land on mitigation strategies inside and outside and, you know, what to do in, you know, when there's a COVID positive case. And I understand like a lot of this is sort of dictated to the school districts. And as you've all sort of made the point today, you're, you know, really using the data to drive the decision making and the policy making. Uh, but it did sound like there was a couple areas where there was, you know, you sort of had to make some judgment calls. And I didn't know if there was, uh, yeah, any opportunity for parent input on some of that? Well, I can speak to the fact that I get a lot of the communication um, from the community. Um, <clears throat> if we opened it up to the community, I think we would find ourselves in a deadlock between, please don't make my child wear a mask and please mask outdoors. <clears throat> so we're, yeah. there's this whole spectrum of how people feel, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and one of the things that is really important to remember is that we all have a year and a half's worth of really big feelings and thoughts about how, what has happened to our lives since the pandemic started, and I find it really important to separate our feelings from the science. And especially as the science continues to evolve, you know, what we're seeing is people are like holding on to things from the science from last year, right? People are like, I still don't feel comfortable giving, uh, say our pre-K students manipulatives if we're not then sanitizing them and putting them aside for a week. And we can say, well, the surface transmission has been shown to not be the concern that we thought it was at the beginning of the pandemic. And so we've moved on to worrying more about <clears throat> the respiratory transmission. And so um, I personally feel like asking parents would be, we would be in a deadlock and it would turn into, it would actually rip the community apart in a way, I think. Um, but what's important to me as a nurse and somebody with a degree in science is that right now what we have is the science. And as it evolves, we will continue to faithfully roll with it um, regardless of how we feel about it. Um, so, you know, there's very little actually left to the imagination in terms of our mitigating strategies. We're following both the CDC and the AAP. The one thing that we're really not being as, as faithful about um, <clears throat> is, and more, I, I guess we're just being more transparent about it, is that physical distancing is not always possible. Um, and I can tell you that last year on the playgrounds, um, you, this speaks to your comment, Holly, last year on the playground, um, what we did all the entire recess was to say, please pull your mask up, airplane arms, you need some space between you and your buddy, please pull your mask up, 
move away from your friend. Please pull your mask up six feet. Please pull your mask up six feet. So this year, they're just going to be saying six feet, use your airplane arms, octopus, whatever. Each school had a cute little mnemonic that they used to keep kids remembering that they needed to have some space. Um, so we are still working on the physical distancing. Um, I can tell you the same thing that everyone who works in an elementary school can tell you is that children are magnets and it is um, a losing proposition. And we still spend all day long saying six feet, airplane arms, octopus, um, over and over and over again to try to remember, you know, remind these children that it, that's what's safe. Um, so um, I, I, I guess I just, um, I would never actually think to take it out of science hands and put it into the hands of a community, but that's just me. Thank you, Maria. I, I want to give a chance because we also have the other part of the forum. I want to give a chance to have like maybe one minute per principal or a little less to to just talk a little bit of each school and then we'll uh, we'll move on if there's more questions than COVID. Otherwise, we'll move on onto the uh, time, the U32 dismissal time. OK, just to be conscious of people's time. Uh, we're going to start with Alicia just because she was mentioned first and uh, and then we'll move on. Uh, Caroline, you're on deck. Sure, so I'm happy to talk about outdoor classrooms first. We created 11 outdoor classrooms a year ago, August. Um, and this August, we revisited those spaces and I asked teachers to let me know, did that space work for you? Do you need a new space? Should we look at um, additional spaces? So we still have 11 outdoor classrooms that range from the woods to the fields to the lines, um, you know, the perimeter of the um, soccer fields and the rec fields. Our students go outside multiple times. So Becca, I can't give you a number of minutes a day, but our students go outside both for eating and for learning opportunities, whether that's silent reading or read aloud or to play math games or the first six weeks of school really to do a lot of the responsive classroom collaborative um, group work together. Um, when it's feasible and the first day of school was really hot and hard to be out there, but we were out there even then. Um, we continued last year, and I know we will this year, to be outside for learning throughout the winter. Um, our kiddos from starting at a very young age have eco and they're used to being outside um, no matter rain or snow. Um, and then Holly, I'll just speak quickly to your um, question about other times. Um, and the masking. We don't require masks, but we do certainly um, have a lot of students and adults who wear masks outside um, because that's their choice and that's their preference. And sometimes they just forget that they have it on because they're so used to wearing it. Um, so I think it's kind of a mixed bag when it comes to wearing masks outside, but it's not something that we're policing this year. Thank you, Alicia. Carolyn and Kat, you're on deck. This year at Romney, it has been a high priority to give teachers ownership over their classroom where it is safe to do so. Um, they lost a lot of opportunities for their voices to be heard last year. So that combined with the discussion that we had with our COVID coordinator, Maria, and the leadership team, we utilized the mitigating script strategy of encouraging getting outside as much as possible. And any teacher who has requested anything um, that they've needed in order to be able to educate outside, they that has been approved. Thank you, Caroline. Hey, Kat and Gillian, you're next. At Callis, um, we learned a lot about what worked well and what didn't work so well um, last year. And we're trying to take those key learnings and bring them forward. Um, there were some really practical logistical things that occurred for us at Calis last year. We built um, outdoor spaces with the materials that we had the access to. So we had a lot of tarps and a lot of lumber. Um, it was really hard to pull them together and they did not last. They did not withstand the test of time. The focus this summer um, was to really start building up those outdoor classrooms because being outside as much as possible, learning can happen everywhere, that's a value. Um, and we're trying to establish uh, some sturdier frames uh, so that those outdoor classrooms can last. 
and um, become just a way, a regular way of doing business. We are not attaching an expectation of a number of minutes or subjects that can be taught outside. We are looking for every opportunity. We have continued at Calis this year to with the, the, the philosophy that there is no such thing as inclement or bad weather. There's just poor planning for your, um, your outdoor gear. Um, and uh, that's going to take a lot of relearning um, to establish readiness for learning in whatever setting that we have, but we are committed to that at Calis. Thank you, Kat. Gillian and Erin, you're next. Okay. So at Doty, we don't have outdoor classrooms per se, but all of our classrooms do have doors that go to the outside. Um, one of the issues that we also look at in terms of outdoor classrooms is uh, we need to look at in terms of when we think about universal design for learning uh, and equity issues, those students who have mobility, um, sensory issues, balance issues, being outside can actually be much more difficult for those students. Uh, so we keep a good eye on our ventilation system and we do get kids out as we can. In terms of recess, I am gonna give Alicia credit for this. We have our kids, you know, so they have their masks on and they go outside and they're like, they have to wear their masks like this. And then when they're close to each other, what we do is, is we do cue kids I have some set rules, like on the tire swing, you have to wear a mask. Um, on the play structure, you have to wear a mask. And as we're wandering around during recess duty, if we say mask up, the kids can just then mask up so that they can line up to be outside. So um, it really depends in terms of the amount of time the kids are outside. It really depends on the individual classroom, the needs, what's happening in that particular day but we are looking at, you know, I mean, it's the masking, the hand washing, the distancing. And we, we do have kids outside with masks and encourage them. And what we were talking about today is we've noticed that kids, I think it was Alicia who said they, they forget they have them on. And as time as this week has gone on, I've seen more and more kids outside with their masks on anyway. Thank you, Ken. Aaron and Stephen, I don't want to leave you out. You can go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. So at Berlin, uh, like Gillian, we don't have uh, specific outdoor classrooms um, set up, but it is encouraged that uh, teachers may utilize the, out the outdoors as much as they wish to. Um, really, at Berlin, we've been focusing strictly on our routines using the responsive classroom model um, to ensure that we are implementing our, our safety protocols that we've agreed to as a administrative team. Um, so we do have we do have outdoor spaces that are along our nature trail that are used for things like like eco um, which is utilized each week by some classes. Um, and teachers are taking students out uh, as much as possible for, for breaks. Um, but our focus has really been um, making the best of uh, opportunities with the new procedures and protocols that we are responsible for implementing. Thank you, Aaron. Stephen? So U32 is very fortunate that we get one other mitigation strategy that the elementary schools don't get quite as much and that's vaccinations. And so um, with vaccinations, with masking, with good ventilation, we are pretty confident that we can keep everybody in the building um, as much as possible. Um, we do encourage our classes to, to step outside if they have an opportunity, but our goal um, is really to make sure that we're getting in um, a full year with everybody every day and, uh, and so we're gonna, you know, ask kids to make sure those masks are always up, which has been our, you know, not a big challenge, but a challenge for a few that haven't had to wear them this summer, but we're getting back in the practice. And when kids are outside, we encourage them if they're bunching up to keep the masks on um, or just spread out a little bit um, and take the masks off. And so we think um, 
as I said, my, my elementary colleagues don't get the benefit of that uh, vaccination level for kids because we're pretty much 12 and up uh, for the school. And so we're very privileged, but very happy that we can get everybody in the building this year and not have to do the hybrid schedule. Thank you, Stephen. And, and with that, I don't see any more hands. I wanna make sure that we have the opportunity to talk about the, the day at U32. And I just wanna say that, you know, the, the board, just to put for silk circle on this, the, the board exercising our duty of care is in strong support of the, of the guidance as, our inter, as our acting superintendent and COVID coordinator has uh, has led us through now and all of the state organizations that we are part of, both the Superintendent Association, the Vermont School Workers Association and the Principals Association are working weekly with the state to, you know, to, to make sure that it is for all kids in, in Vermont. And we are, you know, I feel fortunate to be in this uh, district where, you know, universal masking is not, um, it's not something that we're debating. So, you know, I feel really lucky. Uh, Priscilla, I see that you have your hand up being one of our local physicians. Uh, go ahead <laughs> and ask uh, the last question. And then I really want to move into the school time at U32. Welcome, Priscilla. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I just a couple of varied questions and comments. One is I, I wanted to just respond directly to what Holly had said about um, outdoor masks and the Waterbury outbreak, because I had the same um, concerns. I was very alarmed to hear about this. Um, and I actually reached out to a friend who had a child involved in that outbreak. And it sounds like there was a lot of rain that week and they were indoors for a significant period of time. And so it was probably indoor transmission and outdoor and not outdoor transmission. So I, again, it's just one story, but it, it really um, was reassuring to me that it didn't kind of shake everything that we seem to know about indoor versus outdoor. Um, I just wanted to kind of say, I'm so happy that we are trying to move into 2021 and kind of focus on the mitigation strategies that work better. Um, I, I spent last year watching teachers direct traffic and it sort of felt horribly frustrated that that was asked of people and that there was this tremendous effort that was being made to support keeping the schools in session. And I'm so happy to see that we're trying to drop some of the mitigation strategies that probably just are not as effective. Um, I do actually want to ask a couple of questions. I, I'm sorry, I missed the couple, first couple of minutes, so I hope you haven't already covered this, um, about um, testing and about ventilation. Um, and I'm excited to hear that we're going to add testing, and it, this is just fantastic because we have testing widespread now, and we didn't have that last year. And this really is great news. And I just wanted to know if there's any more details that you can share about the specifics of that. And then on the question of ventilation, I feel like this has been received so little emphasis publicly, not from our school specifically, but just in general. Um, and I would love to know exactly what is the air exchange rate in our child's school? And, and is there is that in, information available and can that be shared publicly? Um, I know from our kids that the windows are left open, but that really doesn't work so well in January. Um, and, you know, I'd really love to see, you know, what exactly is the setting on the air exchange rate in those schools and what is the carbon dioxide levels that they've managed, managed and, and are those levels appropriate? So thank you very much. And again, thank you so much for all of the efforts that everyone is doing to, to keep the kids in schools. Thank, thank you. you, Priscilla. Jen? Yeah, I can, I can answer those questions. Priscilla, we did talk a bit about surveillance testing earlier tonight. We are participating. Maria has a big, she's been watching seminars and has a big meeting tomorrow. We're looking at rolling it out the week of the 6th or the 13th, depending on the equipment. And we're hoping by the end of this week that we'll have the virtual consent forms out with many more details and lots more information so that families can sign up. So that is absolutely something that we're doing. Um, and Maria has been working hard on, on getting ready to roll that out. Uh, we do have a lot of information about the ventilation system, and I've actually spent a lot of time in the past day or so trying hard to get smarter about that. We are in the good, um, we're fortunate in that we've invested as a community in our buildings over time a lot. And then we quickly used ESSER money last year to increase and improve ventilation in the buildings that needed it. Um, I do believe we have the CO2 numbers and the air exchange rates. I do not have it at my fingertips right now, but I received a document today that I think is pretty comprehensive. 
And in collaboration with uh, the folks who shared it with me and Chris O'Brien, our new director of facilities, we could share that information for sure. But we're in good shape. We're absolutely in compliance for sure, if not above and beyond. I'm happy to share that when I can. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and we're gonna move on into our, um, our second part of our community engagement. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I don't see any other hands up, Priscilla. That was an all hand. Oh, yeah, okay. So let's move on. I'm gonna give uh, uh, Stephen and Jen uh, the opportunity to do a quick overview and then we wanna do that quickly so people can ask questions. Uh, and we are behind on time, but you know this was important. Okay, so I'm gonna do just a quick introduction to this and then pass it on to Steve and to share more information. And I think that um, what, I, what I wanna say by way of introduction is that earlier tonight, the board engaged in um, their retreat work and talked about um, the importance of engaging the public proactively um, versus reactively. And that this is one of those areas where um, we're thinking about uh, down the line, how to, how to get more input up front, but the decision itself has um, a super clear rationale and we have the data that you've asked for regarding ridership and impact on students and the decision-making process. So with that, I would share, um, I'd pass it on to Stephen to share more information with us. Thank you, Jim. And um, happy new year to everybody in the education world. This is the new year. We don't celebrate uh, January 1st. Um, and so uh, with our new year, U32 had, um, with the board's uh, blessing, we increased our school day by 20 minutes. Um, and there were several things that we speculated about in uh, June about what we would need around buses and transportation and some of those kinds of things. And so we have some better answers around that now. Um, that we can share with everybody. But just a couple of quick pieces of, of our rationale. Um, so adding 20 minutes of instructional time to our school day really allows us to, um, to implement some uh, interventions that we weren't as robust with in the past. And it also allowed us to add back in some time that we had um, used differently um, in previous years. So the two things, um, we've really added um, time to give our middle schools some uh, reading, silent sustained reading. We know from the research that the more uh, time that students spend in reading and particularly some guided reading kinds of practices like silent sustained reading, uh, the better that they do overall. And so, um, so that's one thing we were able to, to make sure that we had in the middle school without detract, taking away from their core time. Uh, in the high school, several years ago, we cut back the time in our classes um, by a, a few minutes uh, to be able to make our callback um, 45 minutes instead of 30 minutes long. And so what this change allows us to do is recover some of that instructional time back into the classes um, so that we can have a 45 minute callback uh, four days a week um, and be able to um, keep our class times um, in, the, in the 70 minute uh, time uh, range uh, for us. And so those were some of the ways that we use that. Now, I know some of your questions were um, the board had allocated $241,000 for busing. Uh, I can report back that um, we thought that we might need up to four additional buses morning and afternoon or just afternoon. Um, what we ended up having is the need for one afternoon bus to run to the very far edges of Calus. Um, so um, we, um, we have just one additional bus run in the afternoons is what we were, we were needing. And, uh, and that cost um, is going to be probably in the um, 25 to $30,000 range once we uh, have that. And then we'll be able to get reimbursed on some of that um, as we move forward in the next couple of years, although we will be rene renegotiating our bus contract. One of the other things that we looked at is um, how many kids are riding those buses. So we have between 16 and 47 kids assigned to our buses. We have 18 buses that run in the afternoon. And so that's actually a pretty good ridership for us. Um, we don't know exact numbers. Those are the number of kids who are, were signed up and were placed on buses, but we'll do a, a, an accurate head count after the uh, first month of school, we usually do a count to make sure how many kids are actually riding the buses. And we've actually had a few kids that have added um, since the beginning of the school year whose parents chose to add them to our school bus routes. So we've had some of that. 
And what we also found is that in redoing the bus routes for the additional 20 minutes, students are home um, about 20 minutes later than they were previously, but there were no longer bus runs that we had to do. So buses are running in the same time frame. So kids are on the bus about the same amount of time. And the last student is scheduled for drop off at 4.07 p.m. So the very last student off of the very last bus for U32 should be home by 4.07. Now, we know that that's been a little off in these first few days because um, we have to hold our buses a little bit longer to let them find them. Um, and so the buses haven't left exactly on time. But um, I know that yesterday we got our buses out a minute earlier than they're scheduled to leave. And so we were, we we're hopeful that uh, that paid off dividends on the elementary side. And I know that, uh, you know, our buses get to the elementary schools um, just in the nick of time right now as it is, but we are gonna make sure that, they, um, that they're out there and on their buses as soon as possible. One other consideration that we had was, would we need to combine kids on the high school routes and middle school routes with the elementary schools? And none of that happened. So we, we did not need to combine any kids from elementary with our middle and high school kids on bus routes, although something to consider in the future uh, in cost savings, but certainly not necessarily something we needed to do to make this happen. And so um, everything else falls within contract and work days. And so there were no other additional pieces that we needed to add and everything seems to be getting off to a pretty good start. Thank you, Stephen. So we, we were gonna break into small groups. We do have, we just did a quick count with the help of Mark. Mark, if you wanna show us, is our new uh, IT coordinator. And we do have about 50 people. Uh, I'm sorry, I, my internet just disconnected me and I'm suddenly back uh, here. So it's uh, sorry, it just totally kicked me out of the meeting. So I'm, I'm here watching these breakout rooms and I'm, I'm, um, I think I'm going to provide a little bit more context for all of you who aren't in a breakout room so you know what we we're expecting to do. I think uh, Flora had disappeared before we could get out there. What we have done is we set up breakout groups for the um, board members and administrators to be able to facilitate the process to hear from all of you there should be an option for you to choose a breakout room, a color group. Is that, that doesn't exist, Ellen? I'm seeing you nod your head. Okay. And I'm seeing that there are a number of you, 39 of you. Yes, you can do it now. Yes. Ellen, can you? You, um, have, to, you have to click on the breakout rooms on the right side of the bottom of the Zoom window. Okay, okay. thank you. So what our hope is, is that you will choose to go to a breakout room by clicking the breakout room icon and looking at the rooms that are have colors on them. And there are three questions that we were asking folks. We were gonna ask folks to talk about what excited them about the change, what concerns they have about the change and what questions they have about the change. And folks will um, take some time to, um, to ask those questions. The board members are gonna facilitate that and administrators will take a couple of notes and then the board will have that feedback. So if you are interested in asking those questions, um, go ahead and click the breakout room icon down at the bottom and you will have the chance to choose your breakout room. But the would, color doesn't mean anything. The color doesn't mean anything. It was just a way for us to try to seamlessly uh, distribute administrators and um, and school board members so that we had representation. Oh, okay. Got it. And I will stay right here in this main room for the time being to talk people through it if there are questions. If we were in a in the cafeteria, we would have broken out into groups all over the place. This was our best 
the option physically or through Zoom to do this. I apologize, uh, Jen, um, computer just not cooperating. So uh, <laughs> were you able to use the, I had to restart, but were the breakout rooms still active and people could get to them? I believe they're active. Own? I haven't checked, Mark, because I don't want to leave this main room until people get to where they might want to be. Um, but right. it looks like there are breakout rooms uh, that are active. There's and a good number of people that have moved into those rooms, yes. So they're working well. Um, so let's see. We've got about uh, two, four, uh, 12 people left uh, to move into, into rooms so far. Yeah, when I'm looking, um, I don't see my name in any of the rooms, and it's not automatically booting me in there like I have before. Right. So, Karen, we set it up this time so that you choose a room. Oh, so okay. If you hit breakout room, assign yourself. To gotcha. Okay. Yep. Got it. Thanks. I got it. So, oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> totally different what I've yeah. done before. Usually, yeah. it's like. You're throwing in something. Oh, let's yeah, see. This yeah, I actually had that set up uh, for everybody, uh, uh, board <laughs> and uh, administrators, but couldn't do it for the public. Oh my God, as the board, that'd be great. You'd be like, I get to pick which hotbed I want to go into. Uh, <laughs> we pre-assigned them. We just had no idea how many members of the public to expect. And so we wanted right. to, yeah. So go ahead, if you want to answer those questions. Um, yes, I see Catherine, <laughs> a question. <laughs> So I'm sorry. I, I, went, I went into the breakout rooms and I, I, I am such a Zoom, like not very familiar with all of this. Um, so is there any specific way to join it once you go into the breakout room? Right. Yeah, you should be able, you can select it and then to the right, it should say join. And then I can add. also, you I have, can to, also you have to hover over it. When you hover over, so when you're looking at orange and it has four, Okay. You hover over it, it says join, and then you get to go. I need to hover oh. over the orange, not the participants under the yeah. orange. Yeah. Give that a try. And if it doesn't work, we'll try to talk you through it again. And and I can actually move someone into a room. So if if you are having trouble getting into a breakout room, if you can let me know who you are and what room you want to go to, I can yeah. do that for you. Mark, it looks like Liz Guilfoyle would like to be assigned to her. Yeah, room. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing the icon. Maybe again, I'm not. No awesome problem. Zoom, Liz, so. what room would you like to go into? Uh, um, yellow I, has, I'm not yellow has the any fewest people. You yeah, feel free to move me yellow. wherever it looks appropriate. That's I'll fine. put you in yellow. Here you okay. go. Thanks, Mark. Um, and, and I would also be willing to go into anything. I'm still not able to Kathy, hover. Okay, it's or Catherine. Yes, uh, yeah. let's Thank put you, you into the uh, orange. Great. All right. Thank you. Off you go. Thank you. Do we have a uh, Denise who is yeah. having some difficulty? Anybody? Denise, are you interested in joining a breakout room for this conversation? No, I'm all set. I'm multitasking, okay. and so I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> so they'll. Would you they'll like to listen to... in a breakout room? And, and so no, we... I'm all. I'm all set. Are we coming Very back good. after after the breakout rooms? Are you coming back and gathering people? We are. So you can hang tight here if you'd like. Okay. Perfect. And, right. Thank you. Um, Kathleen, would you like a breakout room? No, I'm the same way. I'm just going to hear the conclusion. Thanks. Okay, great. All right. And then I know, Maria, are you all set? Do you want to stay here or go to that conversation? I'm also, I don't have um, a dog in the fight about the time change. So I'm, I'm just hanging out in case anything else came up. Very good. And then um, Lisa is taking, you're fine where you are, Lisa. Yeah, I think at this point I would be more disruptive. I'm just going to sit tight. <laughs> <until they can. laughs> And All Orca's right. going to stay tight here. So um, what we didn't, I'm going to, uh, Mark, I need to find out just how long till we bring them back. Okay. Um, and then do you know how to bring us all back? You close the breakout room? I uh, Just close the rooms, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Give me a second and I'm going to work there'll on be a, the There will be a 60 second notice that comes up that you have 60 seconds before you're booted out, I yeah. guess. Yep. Very good. Yeah. So let me just, I'll, I'll, I'll be back.
appreciate you very much. And so I am taking the hand on the last one. 30 seconds left before they close automatically. Thank you, Mark. So we're going to wait for everybody to come back. I'm going to try to plug my computer so it doesn't die. Okay, there. We have everybody now, Mark? Right now, it closed. Okay. So welcome back, everybody, to the main session. I see that Jan has already put our Google form on the on the chat. We we want your feedback on how this community engagement uh, forum went for you. So please give us our feedback. If you don't have time right now, it's also posted on the website. We're gonna allow some time for each group to share the the highlights of their uh, conversation. So let's start with uh, with red which would be Diane, Scott, Alicia, and Jeff. <laughs> I defer to Diane. OK. Um, so it was basically, one, one of the thoughts was that uh, the statement being excited about the change was a little overrated and that we were mildly enthused about certain changes. So we did approach it that way. And um, so there were just questions about one was about the history of why dismissal was at 235 in previous years, just to help frame that up. Also, there were some questions about uh, was this impacting the elementary buses um, because they have been late, but knowing that that's kind of getting worked out and it's potentially just um, the nature of the beast of the start of the year and more kids on the buses. And then also um, wondering about um, the, and others, please chime in if I forget things, but wondering too about any of the ripple or impact on the athletic schedule and practice schedule. And it sounded as though those are still running as is with the 440 bus happening. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Jonathan and Chris whoever your spokesperson is, it can be an administrator. So, okay. So, so we, well, I'm gonna split this with, with Kat Bear because um, un, unusually she was very talkative. Um, but um, so we had, we had a, uh, a lively and involved discussion. Uh, we didn't really talk much about the start time, but we talked about the buses and it sounds like it's a work in progress. Um, and the other thing that we talked about was actually um, Thinking about having a student, students who ride the bus being trained on how to ride the bus um, to be able to say, this is my stop when they're going by this bus, because there are experiences where students don't speak up and then they're, they're gone behind and caused this delay. Um, so Kat, you want to bring up the other things we talked about? Yeah, uh, the one thing that uh, also came up in that conversation that Chris is sharing about te teaching student expectations, a, a lot of our kiddos haven't ever ridden the bus or it's been more than a year and a half or almost two years since they've been on a bus. So teaching expectations is super important. Another issue that came up is the concern that if we are um, concerned about the timing and being timely for the bus, what's to stop unsafe practices of speeding and not being safe uh, for, for the bus uh, uh, drivers. And one of the things that I felt like was important to share to our group was the fact that um, the, our buses are come through a contracted provider and they come with Zonar. And what that means is there's a district employee, not someone from the bus company that can check whenever a concern is raised to find out how fast a bus is going, how long they're at a stop, um, on what road and what time, but they need to know where to look for that. Um, and I think there was a wonder and maybe a suggestion from our group, Chris, if I'm saying this right, that um, it would be great if we put in our front porch forums how important it is to reach out to us directly if a concern, if you have a concern so that we can look into it. Did I say that right, Chris? You, you absolutely right. Correct. And we'll follow up on that. Thank you. Uh, so the yellow group, Carrie, Caroline, Chris, Michaela. Yeah, one of the um, questions that came up that I, I thought was resonant was um, 
how impactful actually is the extra reading time? And um, we talked a little bit, or I responded to that a little bit, but um, not not really knowing and, and one, hoping that um, that extra 20 minutes really does make a difference in the context of, it makes for a very long day for the student and for the family. Um, and um, yeah, that was, I thought it was a, a really good question. Thank you. Also, sorry, can I just add um, yeah. kind of the other theme was just, um, you know, a parent mentioned that she, the first she was notified of the change was in the transportation um, survey email and still was not clear um, on the change. And so was just concerned about lack of communication. Thank you. Green, Stephen. Julia and Michelle. Um, I'll make a brief comment and then defer to the administrators. Um, but um, in, in our group, it was a, uh, a new family to the district. Um, in the district they came from, this was a normal class day for them. So um, it, it was kind of business as usual. But um, and, and any of the administrators in the group um, want to add anything? I would just add, um, they asked some really thoughtful questions. Um, they were interested in how we use our early release on Wednesdays, which was a really nice conversation to have. And Ellen Dorsey shared some of her perspective on how um, the lengthening of the school day has had a great benefit to our students, has a capacity to have a great benefit to our students. Uh, so we felt for this family, because they were um, there were a lot of School administrators and a board member, um, so they had our full attention, but it, they asked great questions. It was a good conversation. Thank you. Uh, our blue group, uh, Lindy and Ursula, Aaron and Lisa. <laughs> I can take it, I guess. Um, we had a consensus in our group um, on being glad that the students had an opportunity for extra reading time for the middle schoolers or more class time and feeling that that was a quality um, effort and glad that they had that. Um, I think some of the concerns that were raised were um, the afternoon timing being tight. There was some discussion that they feel that it'll probably smooth out as the kids start to learn which buses they belong on at U32. And as everybody kind of gets into their routine and figures it out, we have not seen winter yet and seen how those delays will affect um, getting the buses to the elementary schools on time though. And the only question that was really raised was that we were sticking with this for the year. And I think we all kind of came to the consensus that it is set, it is done for the year. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, pink group, Maggie, Jonah, Stephen, and Kara. Um, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, what this means for the schedule, what it means for, uh, you, I think it was you know, callback time, right, and what the give and take in the minutes of the day are. Um, uh, we had a, a parent who's, uh, uh, who's, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I believe that uh, uh, family was new to the district last year during the COVID year. Uh, and now this is sort of the first time full, you know, full, full in person. Um, it seemed like the, uh, the thing that we um, spoke about the, the most and the guys, again, correct me if I'm, if I'm misinterpreting this or, or misremembering this, but, uh, uh, but the, the traffic flow in front of U32 and the, uh, 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 you know, getting back to one way, uh, you know, entrance into the building and getting better signage so that that traffic flow moves better. And I would, I would, you know, ask Stephen, uh, you know, fill in all of the gaps that I left, please. No gaps. Good job. Okay, so our, we are the last group. If Floor Jill couldn't join us today, and Gillian and Amy were in my group too. I'm just uh, Gillian took all the notes, so I'm gonna let her speak. I'm just gonna say the three first ones because I was, I was happy to hear there are parents that have kids in the school too. Anything to help kids learn. Great to extend the day, more opportunities, more time at school with teachers. 
And Gillian, can you talk about the other two, the data and, yep. So the concerns that came up similar about the sports and the impact of bad weather um, and how is that going to back up in the elementary and the question that Nicole had was around what are we going to do and hoping that we're going to do some data collection to um, measure the impact on student learning and outcomes. It. Jen, do you have any final and just remind everybody about the form? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think that what we want to say is thank you for um, going on this journey with us tonight. Doing this uh, remotely via Zoom was just a, a, a bit of a wild ride. And for those of you who didn't get into a breakout room right away, thanks for your patience. Thanks for your participation. Um, and uh, leadership team, thanks for taking all those notes and coming up with that awesome form. To do that, we'll get that shared. Um, I would say that one of the um, practices that I think is the most important thing is to always uh, seek feedback. So we're asking you to let us know for tonight what went well about this forum, what, what would make it go better, what changes would you have, and what questions might you still have. So as Flora mentioned before, on the Washington Central uh, District webpage under board resources, there is a link, and I've placed the link to the feedback form in the chat. So we hope that you all take a few minutes to give us some feedback and um, and then the steering committee will take this feedback, share it with the board and make the next forum even uh, better. Thank you, everybody. Scott, you have a question? Uh, just, a, just a remark that um, the small groups were great. Um, it's the most human and enjoyable interaction that I've had at a board meeting in a long time. <laughs> so I hope that we can repeat that in future. Thank you, that's great. Okay, so the board still has some business. You are welcome to stay. Uh, we're gonna try to be quick, but we have a couple of things. Thank you to all the administrators for helping us out. Uh, thank you to the community for willing to be here tonight and spend a beautiful evening in front of your computer. And we're going to move on into the next part of our agenda. Okay, if I can find it right away. So let's move into personnel. Oh, oh no, actually, we're let's do the uh, let's do the uh, the driver's ed. Driver's ed. Sorry. Yeah, I found it. So Jen and Stephen, uh, on page Lisa. twenty, on page twenty-seven in your packets is a memo um, summarizing the needs that Stephen and Lisa have written and taken the lead on. And so I would invite them to share with you um, what the need is and what we're asking for right now. Sure. Hi all. Um, so the letter is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to repeat all of it to you. I will just summarize. So our driver ed teacher um, was offered a very nice position in May um, to be the executive director of the Vermont Special Education Association. So he resigned from us. At that point in time, we posted um, and unfortunately, uh, due to timing and some other difficulties around licensure, we were not able to find a uh, qualified candidate, not for the lack of trying, um, so much so to, uh, to act applicants actually from California. Um, unfortunately, uh, Vermont doesn't offer a college that teaches the courses that are needed. St people need to have at least three classes to have provisionals. Um, and the local schools, which are Keene State in New Hampshire, and then one in Pennsylvania, haven't offered the classes lately. So we are really stuck in a pinch without a driver ed teacher. We had 72 students enrolled in the class, which is what we normally are able to um, teach in a year. So we reached out to both the DMV and the AOE to come up with what we thought options would be, and the options are in that memo. So we are looking to ask all of you, the board, um, to approve uh, the use of funds that would have paid a teacher to be able to use that for vouchers for those 72 families 
Um, possibly it could be more depending upon what the salary and um, amount is. And so a um, couple of different options. I reached out to six different uh, local, all the way from Waitsfield to uh, Moortown, like anywhere around Washington County. And I've heard back just recently as of this evening from two different teachers. So we would like to be able to offer two different options. Um, one option would be we have a teacher who's willing to teach in this, and this will all be spring because they have unfortunately are all booked for fall. Um, we have one teacher who would be willing to teach for 16 students on U32 campus from three o'clock till about 4.30 and be able to get the class through. So the students who don't have transportation to get to a private class could take the driver ed course on our campus and still be able to utilize our late buses. We have another private driver ed teacher who is willing to offer um, 30 slots uh, in between the seasons. So I believe it's like March to April. So in between the sports seasons at U32 um, from 6 to 8 p.m. So that would get 46 students through um, with just our students. And then um, the remaining uh, slots, forgive me, I haven't done the math and it's late and math is not in my wheelhouse. Um, so the rest of them, we would like to be able to have them have the option of um, looking at the DMV website where it, where it lists all of the private driver ed teachers, letting them pick what works best for them, and then us providing vouchers to pay for the courses. So I believe what we're looking for is board approval to use the funds differently than um, we would have used had we had a teacher. And also please know that we are actively recruiting, um, hopefully so that we will have a teacher for next year. And we do have at least one in-house person that I'm aware of uh, who's interested in and is working with um, local colleges or Keene State and Littleton, it's community college of something in Littleton, New Hampshire um, to hopefully be able to be at least have a provisional certification for next year. Any questions? Is there going Lisa? to be any process in place to ensure that students who choose the voucher option are actually checking in with the AOT website and, and that there's follow up? Because just a question of equity there that that may the problem solving and organization around that may be a challenge for some students. So uh, I'm not sure I completely uh, understand the question. Up. Maggie. But, mm -hmm. I'll, but I'll try. So um, I guess part of my thinking is, is that the, um, any family that wanted to go the private route would then get an invoice, would then bill us, and then we would actually pay the driver ed place. And the school counselors and myself would help any of the students um, with accessing and trying to figure out how to, how to find slots. Does, did that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, that's exactly my question. It's just, you know, it, not having it built into the school schedule and with the availability on site could really cause a barrier to some families. Right, which is why we were from an really, organizational yeah. standpoint. That's why we were, were advocating really strongly to, to be able to get at least some of the slots on campus prior to the late buses for families who, who couldn't access that so that there was some equity. Scott and then Diane. Do we have a sense of the um, net budgetary impact here, just sort of ballpark? Will, will all the costs be covered by out of the salary of the open position? Or will some yes. of them, I see yes. nodding. Yes. So I know Suzanne's nodding and I'm nodding because um, we're estimating that uh, even if we're spending about $800 on average per student for vouchers or for the courses, um, that's going to come up way less than what the salary of that position was um, at this point in time. Yeah, uh, Scott, it's actually a savings to the district of about $30,000. Is there any potential for expanding the number of students who might have access in the future, having previously had a child who had to pursue private because of the timing and age? You know, there are a lot of kids who just don't have access when they are legally eligible for driver's ed at U32. So, so Maggie, oh, go ahead, Stephen. 
I was going to say, Maggie, so uh, the first issue is that we don't have enough slots yet for the 72 kids who've signed up. And so we're going to try to make sure that because we do that through a, a, I don't know, it's not quite a lottery, but we do, um, you know, for the kids to get into the class. So we're going to try to make sure we get the 72 first and then we can start evaluating whether or not we can do more. Um, we're, we're just way short right now of even getting to those kids. And I think Maggie, Maggie, right now we um, we actually U32 gets through more students every single year than most other schools. Um, we know there's definitely a need, um, but um, we are on the larger side of numbers to be able to get students through. And the AOE, um, they're basically allowing this option because we don't have a teacher. This is not an option that they want schools to pursue. Um, the requirement is that schools have to are required to offer um, driver ed during the during the school day. So they're they're allowing these options just because we don't have a teacher. So I think it was Diane and then Chris. So just a couple. One is somewhat what Maggie was saying, but are you capping the number at this point? And then the other thing is um, the if if people with a voucher were to call now. Would they still would they get the same response that you're getting in terms of people are too full already even in the fall? Um, and then the other question was Vermont Higher Ed Collaborative used to do a course, but it sounds like they don't offer that anymore. No, so I will tell you, I did have one family um, get back to me a week ago and they did find a, a, an opening um, that one of the instructors who is interested in teaching the 30 slots for us at the 6 p.m. time, um, he is trying to find other instructors who could do the driving piece of it to be able to increase that. Um, as of right now, he does not have additional drivers. So it's, it's not just the actual class time, it's all of the driving time that needs to be done. Um, I did have one driver read, so I reached out to six of them, like I said, that were local. One of them immediately called the office and said, I'm full till next year, please don't give my number out. One of them said that he's actually teaching less due to some, um, you know, uh, some personal concerns. Um, and then, like I said, I had the, the, the two, the four, the fact that we have 46 slots is um, pretty impressive right now. Um, and I do believe, like, I guess I would ask that, um, we would, if we can't get all the kids through in the fall, spring, that the board authorized that the money could go into the summer, right? So these students could still actually, um, you know, be able to find a class before next year starts. Chris? Um, I, my question's been answered. Thanks very much. Super. Scott, is that another hand? Uh, yeah, thanks. I just like to move that the board authorize using the salary of the open driver's education position to cover the cost of the options in the uh, memo dated August 27. And I'll second that. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Chris. Can, can I offer a friendly I, amendment that we, can we, and I offer a friendly amendment that we allow those funds to be used until the beginning of the 2022-23 school year to cover the summer concern uh, that Lisa had. Do you have that, Lisa? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, I got it. <laughs> okay. Great. So okay. I had a question, though. If we limit it to, are we limiting the slots, or are we saying that once we hit that salary, we're capped? I would love for you to say once we hit the salary, we're capped. Because then if we can actually get more than 72 through, then mm -hmm. fabulous. Okay. And, that, and we would have spent that anyway. So it sounds like a sensible cap. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Stephen. All those in favor of the motion as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? The motion carries. If, let's move into personnel. Thank you. Stephen and Lisa and Jen. Let's move into personnel. Uh, Lindy, can I put you on the spot? Do you have? I have them open. Designations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I do. Um, I would. I was wondering about there. There's a few things, but the resignation, the paperwork wasn't in there. Is that? I guess it's not a problem. The other ones are in there. 
in our packet. Yeah. And the name. Wanna, uh, sure. Do you want to make a motion and then we'll discuss? Is that okay? okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, I make a motion to accept the resignation of Mackenzie Kernow, East Montpelier Special Ed teacher. Thank you. Could I have a second, please? Second. second. Okay, you guys did it at the same time. I'm gonna give it to Jonah. Sorry, Chris. Get the <laughs> other one. Okay, so we have a second. I'm gonna ask for reconsideration, Floor. <laughs> <laughs> you had the other one. You have to be willing to share. So, uh, you had a question, uh, Diane. Oh no, I mean, uh, Lindy, you had a question. Jen? I just wondered. Um, the paperwork wasn't in the packet as far as the resignation, where the ones for the appointments were. And I thought they usually are. So this was one that, that we missed for you all in August. This was somebody who um, we hired and who in July uh, ended up deciding that she could not come after all. So she, she was never here. Um, she was coming from out of state and due to family circumstances was not able to make the move. This is what caused the shift in um, special educators that we talked about last month. That answers my question. Yeah. All those in favor? Yeah. Oh, sorry, any other questions? Would it be possible just fill in new board members on what that changes in special education for East Montpelier? So we had had a special educator who um, was assigned to, wait, let me get this right who is assigned to East Montpelier who chose not to come. We had somebody right. assigned to another school who's shifted to East Montpelier. And then we had somebody who was um, designated to be an instructional coach who has a special education license, who's mm -hmm. currently serving as a special educator as we continue to search for another special educator. That's great. That Thank you. Out. Appreciate yeah. the back info. Thank you. Uh, any more discussion? All those in favor of approving the resignation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, let's move to five, the change in FTE. All right. Um, we have two people, and I'll do it in one motion. Hold um, on. Wendy, can I just, uh, there is a typo there. Can I just correct it so you don't have to correct the motion first? Okay. Yeah, so Mary Carpenter, that is a typo. Mary Carpenter is currently employed as a 0.5 math interventionist. What we need to do is um, increase from a 0.5 FTE to a 1.0 FTE math interventionist. Sorry about oh, that mistake. Thank you. Um, I make a motion to increase Mary Carpenter at Callis from 0.5 to 1.0 FTE as a math interventionist and to change Mona Lutz at Doty from full-time 1.0 to 0.45. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, could I have a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Stephen. All those in, uh, any more discussion? Diane? Just wanted to uh, clarify and check in as to whether or not uh, Gillian uh, would need additional support or if she's uh, in favor of this. Gillian, are you still here? Yes, I know that we are looking for support so that we have full-time help in the office right now, yeah. And, and that was the, the question, not to say no, that we wouldn't approve it for Mona, but just to make sure we provide what's needed. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. All those in favor of approving the change in FTE for Mary and Mona, please say aye. 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 And thank you, Mona. Thank you. Any, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. A new hire. We have one more. A new hire, Lori Shepard, athletic director for um, the elementary schools of Berlin, Callis, Doty, and Romney. Thank you, Lindy. A second? Second. 
Thank you, Chris. Wait, wait, any discussion or questions? Stephen. Why do we need this? Because <laughs> we had one, but no, hey, Jen. Uh, all right, I'm going to attempt, but I'm going to invite my elementary colleagues to help me out on this one. Um, we offer some sports across our elementary schools after, after school. In some cases, it's a rec department that oversees and supports that. In other cases, it's a position in our school system that helps to coordinate that. Elementary principals, what did I miss there? Um, a few years ago, the some of our rec associations, previously, um, every town had a rec association that monitored and had oversight over it. As we began to move towards some more structure and oversight around liability um, and background checks, it became clear that, um, at least in most of our towns, not at East Montpelier, that we needed to take, the schools needed to take on oversight and manage the liability of um, the athletics and recreation, and also to ensure that we're offering those enrichment activities to all of our students where possible. Um, and over the last few years, it, it's evolved from an athletic director in one building to the wisdom of saying, we're all trying to work together. It would be wonderful to hire one person to have some oversight over all of our buildings. East Montpelier is not a part of the fold because what they're doing currently is working and they, there's no reason to make a change in that. I don't know if you'd add anything more to that, Alicia. Nope, you said it well, thank you. Okay. And that's at least the history. I don't know if that's the rationale that you're looking for, Stephen. Haven't we had someone in this position? Yeah, so it's not a new position. Chris is the, uh, was hired to a different job, so he left the position and now it's uh, open. I, I'm okay understanding that it's not a new position. Okay. The paperwork right. didn't make that clear. Usually it says who's leaving but this was a position that already existed. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of doing you, of hiring Lori, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Hearing none, the motion. And that concludes business for tonight. And we have an executive system. Uh, for the board members, you're not done yet. <laughs> uh, could I have a motion to move into executive session for personnel? I move to move into executive session for the purpose of personnel. Second. Okay. Uh, Lindy is getting that one, Chris. Sure. I'm just. Uh, any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So, Mark, would, would uh, able to please move us into executive session with our super, uh, our acting superintendent, Jen Miller, please. I would like to do that. But my computer is once again frozen. Are you able okay. to hear me? Let me. Okay. I'm sure I can try able that. To hear you. Okay, yeah, okay. sorry. Or I, I can just, do it if that doesn't work. It just did it as I started to do that. I, I can I can try to do that for us real quick. Hold on. Thank you. Otherwise, I, if I just would take enough, you know, a minute for a restart, and I can get back in and do it. But. It's it's okay, Mark. If Jen can't do it, I'll do it from here. All right, I'm gonna give it a go here. Hold on. Thank I you. bet you've got it. I'll restart once again, and then if it's still not, you know, if you can't get it, I'll be back in in just a moment. I apologize. Okay. Is anybody okay. going Thank anywhere? You. I'm moving people. I might have to hold on. Um, let me finish. Let's see. All right, I'm going to open the room and try it, everybody. I think I got you.
All right, I'm gonna, now I have to get myself in. <laughs> Somewhere, bye. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to give a couple more seconds for everybody to come out of. To Recording in progress. There. There's Chris. Okay. Would you like me to close the uh, breakout rooms floor? Do, do you want me to what? Sorry, Mark, no, I missed part of what you said. Would you like me to close the breakout rooms so that everybody comes back? Oh, yes, yes, please. We should all be in a general session now. Yes, please. I believe we, I think we are all here. I think we're here. I think most people had left already, Mark. So, it, Jonas, do you have a motion? I do. Uh, I move to designate Jennifer Miller Arsenault to serve as interim superintendent for the 2021 2022 school year. Please. I'll second that. Thank you, Kari. Any discussion? Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Jen for your willingness to support your district and all those in, in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carrying none, the motion carries unanimously. Welcome, Jen. <laughs> thank you. You're already doing it, but thank you. We feel fortunate. So uh, that concludes the business for tonight. Thank you everybody for your patience and thank you for participating in the retreat and the community engagement. So have a good evening. Chris, do you have a comment or you're gonna move us to adjourn? You're muted. <laughs> Just saying good night, good night. everybody. Good night, y'all. See you later, bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.